One of the biggest elements of the culture war, one of the biggest concerns is our children. And I often talk about how these uh, these leftists, they're, they're very much in favor of policies that either cause irreparable harm to themselves and their kids, or they outright just don't want to have them, either through abortion or sterilization. But when you look at the propping up of celebrities like Lizzo, who has very serious health problems, it seems like it seems like the, the things they do are not conducive to long-term survival. I'll try to be very nice about this. And so the response I get from people is, yeah, that may be, but they're coming to indoctrinate your kids so they can turn well-adjusted children into socialists or maladjusted individuals. And that's why we're hanging out with Dr. Trent Talbot of Brave Books, because you are combating this. We also have Josie, the redheaded libertarian, who actually has kids and uh, has, has dealt with this stuff. So do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, Trent Talbot, uh, founder, CEO of Brave Books. And, and yeah, super excited to be here and talk to you, Tim. Yeah, what do you do? Well, I, I started Brave Books, and what we do is we create Christian conservative children's books. Uh, they're, they're picture books, and we take on ideas that are out there um, so that we, we're a tool for parents to help equip their children with truth so that whenever they're faced with these ideas that are out there, they, they've already had these conversations with, with their parents. And, I, and, and we help parents reinforce the values you know, that they hold dear. And then I think the, there's one book that a lot of people probably know. It's, uh, what is it, Elephants Are Not Birds? Yes, yeah, Ashley St. Clair. That, that was our first book. Yeah. And, and yeah, Elephants Not Birds, that's, that's was our first book. That's part of the reason why I got into this in the first place is that whole issue. And um, and yeah, it, it struck a chord and that sort of launched us. And now we're, now we've done 23 books. Kirk Cameron's coming out, he came out with his second book with us yesterday called oh, cool. Pride Comes Before before the fall so, so wow that's getting a lot of attention for kids us. yeah yeah wow. i mean i mean pride's a pride's a topic that kids need to need to know about it's it's a it's an issue you know do you mean so uh that is interesting i, I want to get into that uh but let's also introduce josie yeah. josie who are you hi i am josie i am the redheaded libertarian on twitter i'm a wife i'm a mother i'm a blue state refugee and i do outside media work at timcast.com Right on. So let's let, let's jump right in. I, th I think that's interesting that you said uh, pride is something kids need to learn about because I think the argument with Target right now is it's something they shouldn't be learning about. Right. Having to explain, per perhaps in the sense, the way you're describing it is, perhaps in the sense that there is an ideological movement and that they're going to start coming across people who are espousing these things as opposed to what the left view is in that you should be teaching children about overt sexual proclivities. So... Kirk's book is not about the LGBTQ stuff. It's just about pride and humility. It's oh, about, okay, it, okay, it, okay. Not right. I, I thought you meant like pride right. in the yeah, yeah, like it's Pride Month or whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, okay. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I think, you know, with with Target, there's a lot of people saying like Target's always done this, and I'm like, yeah. Well, I think parents are finally getting fed up with it, and I think the issue is, it's one thing to have a parade. It's one thing to have you know in this neighborhood you you're, you're you're doing something. The problem has always been many of these people are stepping over the line mm -hmm. in that, like the pride parades, you have a lot of nudity, you, you have a right. lot of gratuitous adult activity happening on the streets, things that should not, that aren't legal to be completely honest. I don't even know how, yeah. and, and, I, and that's been, been that way my whole life. But when it comes to the target issue, I think it's um, parents are walking into target and then they're seeing their kids are with them. And then I can't imagine what it must be like. And you guys can tell me. Having your seven-year-old say, uh, you know, what is what is what is uh, uh, you know homosexual mean, or right. what is LGBT refer to, and then now you're you're tasked with, I haven't even talked to my kid about normal reproduction. Yeah. How are we jumping into kink and these other things? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's confusing for him. I mean, my my oldest is about to turn three, so I haven't had. I haven't, you know, been faced with, with with that yet personally. I know you have, Josie, um, but I could only imagine it's got to be super confusing for kids. I mean, it's kind of confusing for me. So, so um, yeah, they they've just gone way too far, and I'm I'm happy that the Christian conservative movements are flexing their muscle a little bit, you know, because a general principle in life is that you what you get in life is what you allow, and right. Christian conservatives have just allowed allowed this they've allowed the corporations to slap them across the face time and time again and so it's it's nice to see that you know this giant this giant of the 
silent majority is starting to wake up a little bit. It is interesting to me that we had a we had a caller on Timcast IRL last night for the members show saying that uh, asking, do we think that allowing gay marriage opens the door to what we're seeing now? And my response is the very traditional liberal response of if two adults are going to go do something private in their own home, if they want to be there for each other in the hospital, like that's that's I'm, I, I don't care about that. I think they should be allowed to be with the people they love and care about. The idea that because one thing happens, we now are faced with groomers and things like that. I disagree with. I think the issue is it's one thing to say, look. Those two, those two people can do what they want. It's another thing to be like, we sat by and did nothing as people started trying to enter schools to groom children. The fact that there is this major backlash, I think, shows people are, n- are not accepting of everything. And, the, and I, 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 I understand there's, there's obviously a correlation, right? The, the pride flags, everyone, stuff like that. But I think the fact that you're even seeing traditional liberals be like, hey, man, get that stuff away from kids. Yeah. It shows that there's a red line for everybody that we may tolerate or we may say, OK, you know, fine. Like we want to make sure everybody can be with people they love, but not when it comes to you indoctrinating kids and doing all that stuff. So I think the red line's there. I think people are pushing back. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 whenever it gets into the public square where kids are kids are hanging out and, and kids are seeing that's whenever that's whenever I think that we have to draw the red line. And, and I, I think. Churches have let us down. I think governments let us down in just letting it just be absolute chaos in the public square. Yeah. I mean, to say governments let us down is, you know, like what else is new? But, <laughs> yeah. but, but I also think it's, it's institutional capture. The people who want to implement these policies will start taking roles in government knowing they will get the power over you and they will start implementing these cultural changes. Now you have in schools, kids being shown, I think, what was that? Uh, what was the... The book, I can't remember which state it was. The teacher brought in the book that it's called This Book is Gay. Yes. And it has, I mean, o- overt adult activity descriptions. Yeah. It, even, it. It, it even explained to children how to use adult anonymous gay sex apps. And they're giving it to middle schoolers. They're kids who are like 10 or 11 years old. Whoa. And it's like, okay, okay, no, 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 no. That, that woman should go to jail. Like, n- not, not, like no, I'm not even kidding. Like that, that's a criminal charge to go to a child and be like, here's how you can go on these anonymous apps and engage. Like, what are you doing? You can't do that. This is what's happening when they start infiltrating these spaces. And I think you see two kinds of people, the overt, the people who infiltrate and then want these things in the schools, probably pedophiles. And then you have the ideologically captured people who don't know, don't care. And just like, I'm going to do whatever the mob does. I'm going to do whatever the crowd does. Right. Right. They're, they're just scared of speaking up. And, and for what well, they go along with it, like, I don't think this yeah. teacher, well, it's hard to say on, on one hand, I'm like, Occam's razor would suggest a teacher who provides that information to these kids is a pedophile. Yeah. In the absence of evidence, the solution that makes the least amount of assumptions tends to be correct. But if we start to make more assumptions, if we get a little bit more conspiratorial or I maybe mean, that's not the right word, it's this regular old teacher is ideologically captured by algorithms and press so that she's putting these books in front of kids just because it's popular. And I'm like, yeah, that's a strong possibility. But I look at it like 60-30, I think, or 60-40. This, the simple answer is anybody who tries to teach a child how to use anonymous adult gay sex apps is probably just a pedophile. Yeah. Uh, the thing that they do, they conflate it with burning books if you don't <laughs> let it happen. So uh, porn's always been banned in school always been banned in schools this is not a this is not a new thing but they'll tell you no if uh republicans are book burners if they if they don't let the kids read you're you're keeping kids from reading and then when they say this they put up books like to kill a mockingbird you know they're not putting up gender queer which you know shows shows incest and two boys doing adult acts on each other you know they're they're not saying it's these books that are horrific they're saying it's these books about uh, black people, you know, right. so so things so that the average listener is going to be like, well, well, that that's that's bad. Like when we've got gender queer here, Ian bought it, mm-hmm. and I think conservatives need to read it. They mm-hmm. never do. And I've asked a ton of conservatives, like, have you read this book? And they're like, no, but I've seen the pictures. I'm like, you have to I read this like book. I feel like if I read that book here, this channel would get. Oh no, hands thin. down, absolutely. Like, but you want to no, give no it question. to middle schoolers? 
if if we were to to read and show the pictures, if we did mm-hmm. like a we're gonna read gender queer, mm-hmm. we get we get a strike, no <laughs> yeah. question. Okay. It's got overt sex acts in it. Mm-hmm. And but the book itself is about horrifying child abuse. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And this person does not know they were severely abused. Mm-hmm. And so as someone who grew up in an extremely psychologically and emotionally abusive household, they think that's normal. And to them, because it's a baseline, anyone who says there should be structure and uh, uh, and there should be order is clearly a fascist. When you, you know, when you come from a world of total chaos, any amount of order is fascism. For the average person who understands there's a balance between order and chaos, authority and liberty, and we're trying to find the right balance, typically leaning towards liberty, we know what fascism is. When people like this start taking control and abusing people, and but yeah, you know, in the in the book, uh, the woman who claims to be non-binary explains how she couldn't read till she was twelve. She would def, uh, she would relieve herself outside. She would use uh, de- she would she would use pads menstrual pads that were so old they were crusted with blood which made her smell so awful that she had to be called into the counselor's office the other kids would make fun of her over her yeah social awkwardness and and inability to uh uh, to communicate properly and her stench and so what ends up happening is this this young woman conflates all of that social trauma with being a woman Mm. saying but boys don't have to do these things therefore being a boy is better and then in the book, she says she is sexually aroused at the thought of being a man. So when she has, ch- so she's, that's what she says. The inference from that is she says she's a teacher. If someone comes and says, a woman says that she is sexually aroused at the thought of being a man, that's literally, she does literally say that in the book. Mm-hmm. And then explains how she wants children to call her a man. I'm like, okay, is this per- I, I think this person's a pedophile. Yes, that's, that's pedophilia. And um, if she would, she was sexually abused at a, a young age from my understanding with the book? Well, I don't think the book doesn't say that she was sexually abused. Okay. She was emotionally I I, I think it's abusive to have your child urinate in, in the yard yes. outside. Okay. All I right. think this it's is... abusive to have your kid not be able to read at twelve. Mm-hmm. And she had to teach herself how to read because she wanted to read Harry Potter so bad. I mean it's a horrible story. That's that's so sad. I think it's yeah. abusive, extremely physically abusive to send a girl going through puberty experiencing menstruation with dirty old pads crusted in blood that is when you get child protective services to come in and say something's wrong here so what happens with a lot of people who are pedophiles is they were assaulted when they were children which is why i I was i I assume that that was part of it um i've only read parts of this book but it, the, she may have felt safe around children as a child mm. because all the adults in her life were, were terrifying. You know, so now as an adult, she still feels safe around children, but that leads to sexual proclivities too, such as pedophilia. Well, you know, not an excuse, not defending it by when, any means, just explaining it. She says that she is an auto androphile. Okay. That she so. is sexually aroused as, at the thought of her as a man. Yeah. And then she has children call her male things. I'm like, she is intentionally trying to use these children for her sexual kink. So yeah. this is the author saying these things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, her, it's her memoir. Oh, it's yeah. her memoir. And they put okay, that thought... book in great in middle schools. And so I bring this up, not because when I, when I get into this stuff, I'm like, I can't believe this stuff. They have it in front of kids. I, I have a friend who is, who is gay. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I'm talking to her about it, I'm like, look, like, you know me, like, I don't care about you and the people you love and you care about. You're one of my best friends. I want you to be happy. But you got to see this book. I mean, they're showing children these overt adult acts. And she said, no way. And I was like, let me show you the book because I have it. Mm-hmm. I show her the book. And she goes, yeah, but there's no way that's in grade schools. And I'm like, let me pull up the story and mm-hmm. show you that Ron DeSantis specifically was like, this should not. And when he tried to get to get, get it banned, they say he's, he's banning books. Mm-hmm. Right. You right. know what's that's ironic right. about the banning books thing or burning books thing is what the left is doing. They're taking Raw Dahl. And they're editing his books. Right, right. You know, like that is closer to book burning <laughs> than saying, no, you children can't read this book. Everybody else can. Children can't. You know, it's, it's putting a limit on this. Like, like but going into a store and buying pornography, you have to be 18. Like, that's not book burning. You know, are, are your books in schools? We are in a very small amount of schools. You know, Scholastic 
is the big behemoth when it comes to kids' books. So they're the world's largest children's book publisher, but by far the largest children's book distributor. So they they get all kids' books into schools, libraries, Barnes & Noble, bookstores, everything. And so, yeah, if you're really looking at sort of who to point fingers to, I mean, I th there's probably people that I'm not aware of groups that are making sure these get in curriculums and things like that. But Scholastic is definitely um, captured. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Wow. If you look at their, like who owns the bulk of Scholastic, you see the same people, BlackRock, Vanguard. Wow. Um, they're, the, so they're the largest shareholders. They're trying to capture the world with CEI, DEI, and ESG. I think it's, yeah. I think it, 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 look, I don't want to be conspiratorial. Mm hmm so I often put it simply as intent doesn't matter, actions and results matter. Mm -hmm. The implication is the actions speaking louder than words and the results are these people are Malthusian. They want less people. They, there's too many human beings on this planet. Now, look, man, I'm not going to disagree that we've got pollution problems, that people who live in cities live like slobs. I'm sorry, man. You know, I'm not trying to be mean to the average person, but living out in a rural area, you drive around and what do you see? I mean, people oh. compost, people have gardens, yeah. people have animals. They they produce a little bit of their own food. It's way more sustainable. You see solar panels everywhere because they got good sunlight. You'll go to cities, it's the opposite. Hyper concentration of filth, pollution, yeah. garbage. So look, I get it. But you, you end up with these massive multinational corporations that are actually plaguing society with, with ills and detriment. That's not going to improve things. Im improving the system, if you're upset about it, is through what, what you're doing with these books for kids. It's teaching kids good moral behaviors. Instead, it feels like there are powerful elites who are just like, eh, let's just get rid of them. Let's, you know, we're not going to cull, but we will sterilize, abort, and promote uh, uh, morbid obesity and, and other ails and things like that. Yeah, it, it definitely, I, I see where you're coming from. But if if there are going to be people, we want them sexualized from an early age. We want them confused. We want them. They're saying that. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Not brave books. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird thing for you to promote. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. No, but but I was thinking about this too, and I'm like, intent is irrelevant, right? right. You you come out and say there's a large group of multi of power. Uh, this is really funny. I said that the the world is controlled by powerful elites, and then Media Matters called me a conspiracy theorist, and I was just like, if you go to Greta Thunberg and ask her if the world is controlled by powerful executives who have bad intentions and want to destroy the planet, she will say yes. Yeah. Yeah, the oil companies, the, 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 the big financial firms. I'm like, that's literally my point. But we don't even need to say that. You, 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 you've got all of these policies that just end with one result, less human beings. And I was thinking about, okay, sterilizing kids is very obvious. You, you, you take a kid, put them on puberty blockers, the likelihood that they're able to have children drops substantially. Some may be able to get a puberty, puberty blockers and resume normal puberty, but it's not absolute. There's going to be a large amount of people. It's, I, I was reading this website. We read it on IRL. It says, warning, you know, about this, you may never develop the, the ability to, re, re, uh, to have uh, sexual re reproduction. Yeah, Mayo Clinic says that. So you'll end up with people who can't have kids. You end up with people being sterilized, women getting mastectomies, or young girls, young uh, teenage girls getting mastectomies. And the end result is these people can't have kids. Then you're promoting abortion. And then I thought about like, but what about the weird grooming stuff? I think what does that result in? Whether it's intentional or not, if you have people who grow up with a normal, healthy education and responsible parents, they're likely going to get married, have kids. That is like the default human behavior. But what if you start abusing them and twisting their minds? They'll grow up and start engaging in activities related to like weird objects and paraphilias and those things don't result in children. Yeah. So what is the suicide rate of uh, the trans community? It's it, uh, my understanding is that's very high. Very I'm not entirely high. sure. So they're inducting children into a cult with a high suicide rate, which goes right back to depopulization. Perhaps. I mean, I, I, I do think it's fair to say that uh, endocrine disruptors. Yep are a component as to why we're seeing so many trans kids right now. And it's not so simple to just say it's all social. Mm -hmm. I, I do think there's a social element to it. And it could be correlation and causation could come in either direction. That is to say, the reason we're seeing so much of this ideological bent 
in, 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 you know, towards kids is because there are people who are born of endocrine disruption whose yeah. hormonal imbalances has resulted in them saying, this is who I am and I want what I see to be spread around. But I think if you look at genderqueer, it really breaks down very, very well what the bulk of what's happening uh, is. Parents abused their child severely. That kid does not understand it's abuse because it's it's normalized. And they have books about abuse that kids could read, like they cage the animals up at night and a child called it. These are books available to I read them in middle school. But the 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 theme of that book is that this was very bad. And here is how I've overcome it and grown into a person. For her, it's like this is because I was a woman like she's faulting, you know, people, but also not understanding what happened to her. Like, but these other books have a reflective, like, I'm going to tell you my experience, but I'm telling you from a point of knowing that it was wrong and it was bad now as an adult who's adjusted. You were an ophthalmologist. Yeah. How did you go from that to making these books? Well, um, it started when I had my, my first daughter, Charlotte, but before that, so my, my fourth year of med school, med school, I started a test prep publishing company um, just because I, I started to get a sense that I was not going to like doing doing medicine full time. So I started that. It grew and became pretty successful. I started a second publishing company where we did joke books. And then I was practicing um, a pretty good amount, not full time. And then I became a Christian in 20. 2019, early 2019. Oh, wow. Very, very quickly there. Uh, after that, met the woman who's now my wife and we got married quickly Then had a, had a kid um, in the summer of 2020. So this is like peak COVID craziness, peak just craziness. Um, and, and within the first few weeks of her life, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like getting an, a new car where you see that new car everywhere because it's raised in the love of your, of your awareness. After a kid, after I had no idea that there was this indoctrination of our kids, it was not on my radar. When she was born, it was like I was seeing it everywhere. Oh, I was seeing it Barnes and Noble. Um, the number one book on Amazon was Anti Racist Baby. And then what really sort of put me over the edge was I saw that trailer for the film Cuties. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Charlotte, uh, I, I just, she's going to be that age before I know it. And, and just, thinking about the world that she's going to be growing up in just, I could not get it out of my head for whatever reason. And I was just always thinking about, about that, that issue. And, um, and then this idea for brave books, freedom Island started to come into my, to my mind. And eventually it, the, the vision for it was too fun. And, and it just seemed like a fun fight to get into <laughs> and, and a worthwhile yeah. fight. You know, and it'd be a challenge. So, so eventually, I, I, I decided to go for it and um, sent out some. My fear was that I didn't want to launch books, launch a company, and nobody hear about it. So I, I reached out to um, different conservative influencers. Ashley St. Clair responded, wrote back, said, "Oh, I'd love to do this. This needs to happen." And worked with her. And Brilliant. First, first book was Elephants Not Birds, and then. And then um, started the the Freedom Island Book Club, where our subscribers get a new book every single month that teaches a new, you know, traditional value. And um, and then yeah, the rest is history, and we've we've had a lot of success. We're we're up over thirty employees and growing, wow. going crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. So I suppose to exemplify why this matters, Josie, you had an experience with with your kids. You're a blue state refugee. Do you want to tell that story? Sure. So. Uh, I, I mean, there's a lot to my story. It's between the trans agenda and the COVID, everything that was happening when I lived in Massachusetts. So I have my oldest daughter is a tomboy, or she was when we lived up in Massachusetts. She's much more girly now that we're in Florida. But um, I received an email from an adult in her life that was referring to her as a they, them. And it took me some time to figure out what I was reading because it didn't make sense in the way they were doing the pronouns. Um, and I, I thought there was like a group of people she was referring to. I read it a few times and then I realized my daughter was being misgendered. So I wrote the person back and I said, um, did she ask you to do that? And the person wrote back, no, I didn't want to assume though. And I was like, all right, this is, this is kind of getting into some weird territory. My daughter had come home uh, when she was 10 and told me 
Um, and at this time, it's 10. So yeah, at this time, it's 2020. So we're into the, the COVID. We're into the COVID stuff. So 2020, 2021. So she might have been 11, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. She, yes, 11. So she comes home. Um, we're able to like kind of see certain people, this and that. She comes home. And uh, she'd, she'd seen a friend briefly, social distance, all that bull crap that you have to do uh, up there, and told me she was a lesbian. And I'm thinking, okay, 11 years old. Do you like girls? And she said, no. And I'm like, then then you're not, you know? And she was like, started getting upset and like, well, they told me I was because of how I dressed and what I look like. And it, I was just like, all right, like this is, this is just alarming to me at this point. Like these two things are coming from my daughter based on what she looks like, based on the things she does, based on who she associates with. They're drawing these conclusions that they're trying to indoctrinate her into this cult. But but who told her? A teacher? A, a teacher told your, your, your daughter? Yeah. So why is a teacher going to an 11-year-old and saying you're gay? Going to their mother. So she, so this teacher referred to my daughter as a they them to me um which is when i asked her um did she tell you to do that and the teacher said no she didn't so so i'm not sure what was going on in the school but i know to me right. my daughter was a they them but like did your did your daughter say who was telling her she was a lesbian one of her friends or two of her friends two of her friends and that that's the issue with this 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 stuff's not appropriate for children. They don't know what they're not. talking about. Absolutely, she had no idea. Like I, I mean, she was like I said, eleven. So she had no idea. Maybe they were just was, insulting her. No, no, they <laughs> they were doing it. They were doing it in a way where they were. They wanted a gay friend. Oh wow. Okay, because this is like a clout thing for kids now. You know, to show how yeah. accepting they are because of who their parents are, and that. So that's what what I got to the bottom of when I had really dug into what that what the heck was going on was these kids were just wanted to have a gay friend. And so if they had a gay friend, then they were going to get points for having yeah. the gay friend, you know, and this is already 10, 11 years old figuring this out. Um, so, so, I mean, that's, those were the two really big things that pushed like me being like, all right, you know, we have to get out of the state. We have to get somewhere where this doesn't exist. Like, cause I know my daughter, I know my daughter better than anybody. I know that she used to write her you know, her crush's name on the heart and in a heart on the bathroom mirror and it was a boy not a girl you know because it's it's deeply ingrained what your what your sexuality is even as a child you know when it comes to when it comes to that because of how their parents model it so you know i i knew my daughter wasn't gay but i knew she also had to had been a little brainwashed at that point and had to figure it out herself and this is stuff i've protected her from like she doesn't know about the email from the teacher she doesn't know how I dug in to figure out why her friends were calling her a lesbian. Like she doesn't, she doesn't know any of that. This is stuff I, I protected her from because I could still protect her to an extent from the stuff that she had been exposed to where I couldn't protect her. So, so we, we moved to Florida and a lot of that had to do with COVID too, lots of stuff. So it was just everything coming down on that. But moved to Florida and we're there, we're there in Florida. It's, it's like about three months in. And she tells me, I'm so happy here. I feel like I could be myself. I feel like when I lived up in Massachusetts, people expected me to be a certain way and I couldn't get away from that. But she's like, here, she's like, I have like a new start. So she's like not as tomboyish anymore, you know, because girls outgrow being a tomboy when they're in middle school. But tomboys are also targeted so hard by the queer agenda because it targets mostly girls because girls feel really uncomfortable going through puberty. We have very obvious changes to our bodies that make us uncomfortable and that is normal. So the thing to do is to tell girls, this is normal to feel uncomfortable when your body is changing. Not to say, oh, that's because you were born in the wrong body. But girls are very easy targets for this agenda. And tomboys in particular who are already starting to kind of present as boyish. So uh, so she was a target. But we're living in Florida now. She's 14. She's beautiful. Um, she, uh, she has her first boyfriend. She wears pink. We did up her room in pink and gray. Um, she's, she still loves sports because that's who she is. But definitely not non-binary, definitely not a lesbian, but these are things that were at a very impressionable age when her mind was so malleable, they were coming at her with this stuff. Yep. 
And the fact that they came to me about the they, them, like I said, I have no idea if that happened in the school. I know it happened to me. I assume it was happening in the school. Yeah. I would make that assumption. Well, kudos to you. I mean, what a what a great story of um, an example of a parent who, you know, fights for their kid. And, Thank you. And knows their kid and, you know, and takes. I, I do want to say I didn't have a plan when we moved. We just moved. Like that was it. We sold the house and we got out because that's the big excuse a lot of people they're like oh I can't I I don't have the resources I don't have I didn't you just you just you're like all right this is everything I've ever saved up and we're just gonna live one of the uh there was a big controversy last night the night before recording this Uh where what is a woman from Daily Wire was censored on Twitter I believe now as of recording this it's totally unlocked and can be shared and everyone's starting to share it now and Elon saying like the Streisand effect is gonna mm-hmm. help it and carry and all that stuff. But there's a clip from it where a dad, one of the clips that got banned was a phone call with a dad whose daughter was taken and undergoing uh, medical intervention. And the crazy thing to me was Matt Walsh says, is your daughter on uh, the, 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 the cross-sex hormones? And he says, yes. The, the the court mandated she can do she can do what she wants and I'm just kind of like it's amazing to me that there are people who would say they would rather not have to deal with the struggle of moving selling a house they would they they would rather not have to do that even if it meant their child would be taken from them and placed in a medical intervention that would sterilize or destroy them and it's just strange to me but maybe maybe I don't know I don't have kids. So I, I kind of just assumed that parents would do anything yes. to save their kids. When I hear stories of people saying, like, I live in the city and I can't leave, and there, there's, two, there's two takes on this. If I hear about someone who's like, look, my job's here, I'm not going to leave, and I'm like, it's kind of crazy to me that you would keep your children in these environments because it's, too, it, because it's not that it's impossible, but that it's just difficult. I'm like, wouldn't you run into a burning building for your kid? Mm-hmm. Is selling right. your house and moving the hardest thing? Now, to be fair, there are many people pointed out they literally can't leave for a variety of reasons. There are a lot of reasons people are stuck in cities, and that is where it gets scary. The notable one is there are many people who are like, my wife left me and took the kids. There's nothing I can do, and I'm not going to abandon them. I'm going to stay here and keep fighting for them. And I'm like, that yeah. I get. Yes. Can't do anything about that. Yeah. But in the, in the story of, uh, you know, when I have people email saying like, look, I live here. My whole life's here, my family, my friends. I can't just up and leave. I'm like, I get that. But that's an emotional argument about it's really, really hard to leave. Yeah. My question is, if in five years your child has been placed on sterilization drugs of some sort, would you then think back and say, maybe I should have just left and moved? Exactly. Yeah, or homeschool, you know. Yep, that's uh, the way to get them out yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. People are like, oh, I just can't. I just can't homeschool. You know, I get that because there are, you have a full-time job. You're a single parent. You can't homeschool. Like, I totally get that. There's co-ops. There's there's different ways to do it with people who are like-minded than you. There's you know, private schools. There's charter schools that aren't all that bad. And you even do find some public schools that really have great school committees who are on top of this, um, especially in Florida. You're, you're very lucky to find those. But what, what was on my radar when I was going through this in Massachusetts was that they were starting to talk about laws that would, if you didn't recognize your child's identity, they would take your child from you because it was child abuse. Um, And they have those. That's what that clip was about. Exactly. And they they have that now. They have that where they can do that. They have uh, these bills. They're called trans refugee bills. Have you seen these? All right. So it's Minnesota, Washington. uh, I think Maine's trying to pass one right now. Um, So what, what these are is they say, if you are a child and you can't get your sex change in Florida, say, you can come to our state. We'll do it. We'll put you, we'll, we'll chop off your breasts. We'll put you on hormones. We'll do all of that um, without your parents' consent. And we will not extradite you. So it is legalized trafficking, legalized kidnapping, mutilation, sterilization of children. And they have this in states now. And it was kind of the knee-jerk reaction to Florida's bill saying, we're not going to sex change children here. Yeah. This is what they did. Man, this all goes to dark and I places. Think it's Washington. Washington is where they can kidnap your child. How do you have states that are becoming so hyper polarized when it comes to the issue of abortion, when it comes to the issue of sex changes for children? You've got some states that are absolutist and some states that are uh, 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 abolitionist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, using that language, of course, I wonder where this, this ends up. If... 
you know, a lot of people have said it's a good thing. I, I hear that a lot from conservatives. It's very interesting to me. They say it, it's good that we're getting federalization. Let the blue states do what they want. And I'm like, okay, well, the blue states are saying they're going to take your kids without your consent or knowledge, and then they're going to sterilize them. Why do you not think that law enforcement should be able to, if your child runs away to Washington at 14, 15, and the, the state of Washington then performs a sterilization procedure, whatever the procedure may be, yeah. the, the federal government's not going to do anything for you. What do you do? I mean, there's uh, there's not much that that you can do. Like if the Congress passed these laws, the Congress is in their in their states, their state legislatures pass these laws saying, oh, we're a, we're a trans refuge state now is what they call them. So um, so the police can't do anything because it's it's lawful. Well, I, what is in our control as as parents is what our kids are exposed to. Yes. And how how they're brought up. And so, you know, I would imagine that these kids that are get sent to Minnesota and California for sex change operations, like they, they weren't brought up in a way wh where they were just instilled in truth and solid values. And, and they were left their their children are vulnerable. And it sounds like they were left out with the wolves. And, and so, so to me, you know, some things that we can do as parents to make sure our kids don't end up, you know, as refugees um, to get there to get sterilized is we 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 teach them truth we teach them right from wrong we get them away from screens until they are like 16 18 where their brains fully developed their 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 worldviews developed um, we we pay attention to who who they hang out with we um, we 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 ourselves we I think we all of us need to do a better job of building stronger communities. Community in this country has just evaporated and it's left all of us vulnerable because we don't have those roots. You know, roots give us strength and purpose and and strong relationships that, hey, if I if I know what if I say something stupid here, I'm still going to be beloved back home because I ha have a strong community. Mm -hmm. But if all my relationships are online and they're fragile and they're they're shallow, then I'm vulnerable for groupthink and and all of that. So so I think it just comes down to we just need to do a better job with our kids as parents. And, I, and then I think a lot of these government, you know, a lot of these issues won't affect our kids. Yes, you make a lot of really good points. I do want to point out though that a lot of children, even raised in the best household, because of who they associate with, will rebel. And in the way that you know I may have rebelled as like a skater kid in the '90s, they might rebel as uh, trans. They might rebel as non-binary. They might rebel in a different way to kind of set them apart because that seems to be what what this is a lot of the time. So it is very important to know your children's friends, to meet their parents, make yeah. sure that they're they're that they're that they're from good a good home. Yeah. Uh, something because if your child's going to be spending time there, then your child's going to be in that home too, and you want to just make sure that they're safe as you well. You know where we're headed. Where there's going to be and may already be. Let's say you live in. Texas. And you think, look, my kid goes to a good private school. We're good. Kid at the local park. You know, let's say your kid's 12 or whatever riding bikes and has got little friends, little Jimmy, Johnny, Sarah and Jenna. And you're like, they're good kids. I see them playing. Nothing weird out of the question. Your kid goes and hangs out with Jenna's parents at Jenna's house and they're having a birthday party. And Jenna's parents are very woke, but also they know not to say these things to conservatives. They're very concerned. If we say they may freak out and it could be bad for the child. And then without your knowledge, your kid is being told you're actually a lesbian. You're actually, yeah, I can tell by the way you dress. Did your parents tell you this? Did they let you know? And the kid says, no. And it's like, they'll probably get really mad at you. This is very groomerish behavior. But you know, you know where I see this going? With these new laws, it's only a matter of time before one of these kids says, do you feel like it? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Okay. Get in the car. They drive them to Colorado or whatever state nearby. You now haven't heard from your kid. They bring them to Washington and they say, this child is trans and needs the, needs the procedure. You freak out and call the police. Washington says they did nothing wrong. There's yeah. literally nothing wrong with what they did. It's, act, it's protected under the law. That makes my skin crawl as a mom, that story. Mm. Yeah. Now, I think 
some iteration of that is 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 the doors being opened because of the laws, the sanctuary laws that are being passed. Texas will still say something like you kidnapped this child and they'll say. Do something. Washington's protecting us. The federal government, of course, and the Democrats gonna be like nothing was nothing wrong. Nothing wrong happened. A child was being abused and they they say rescued the child. Bye. And then you don't see your kid. Oh or when you do, they come back, they're sterile. Oh, my God. That's that's like a terrifying <laughs> feature. Well, this is how would a child get to Washington? They had to they could take a right. bus or to get a ride. Yeah. So another scenario is one of your kid's friend's parents, because you don't know them, says, I'm going to give you a hundred dollars. You get on this bus mm -hmm. and you go to Washington and you get the procedure. Mm -hmm. They're not going to say anything like that. They're going to say people there will take care of you and they'll go, okay, okay. And this kid is impressionable, doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. They get dr driven to the bus and then the kid gets on the bus. And says, I didn't do anything. The, ch the child told me that they were being abused, so I gave them some money. Yep. That's it. And then in Texas, they're going to say, well, Jenna's parents didn't do anything wrong. And then you're going to say, where is my child? Where did my kid go? And then you're going to get a phone call two or three weeks later saying, this is Washington Department of Health and Human Services letting you know we've provided gender affirming care to your child. Her breasts have been removed. She is, you know, undergone cross sex hormones. And because of the concern of abuse, we will not be returning her to you. That's it. My kids aren't ever seeing friends again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have, what's that? I have a funny story about I think my... Florida's mostly okay, though, yeah. you know, funny story about one of my daughter's friends. She gets a she gets a text from one of her friends in Florida and she goes, and he goes, is your mom the redheaded libertarian? And she goes, yeah. She goes, I was watching Tim Cast with my dad and I pointed out that's my daughter's <laughs> name, mom. And he didn't believe me. <laughs> so and this is like a, the friend she just had at school. She hadn't been hanging out with him or anything. Oh, so, wow. so yeah, he'd been over for like her birthday party or something. So I ended up bringing her to his house a few weeks later. And like the dad comes out and the mom comes out. And, was, and there's like, I'm like, your kid is not a liar. <laughs> this is where it gets weird because uh for me at least i'm not i'm not christian mm -hmm. but this is why church is so yeah. important it's why i've praised sh uh, shabbat with jewish families it's mm -hmm. why i think church is so important because what you get with these are people of strong morals meeting with each other sharing a particular worldview and it, it is a safe place the thing i think i find absolutely fascinating about shabbat Jewish families say disconnect Friday evening and it's family time until Saturday evening. And what that does is it creates a protective barrier against the ills of social media where your kids are tr they're trying to indoctrinate you and all these things. Now you have 24 hours where it's just the family together talking. And then if a kid says something, they can say, let me explain to you. Yeah. The same thing with church. You have people on Sunday. They show up. They they share a communal moral framework. They know each other, they trust each other, and it is substantially safer having your children associate. You know what really blew my mind? I was hanging out with Seamus uh, Coglin of Freedom Tunes. He was at church and, you know, he let us know, like, I'll be, I'll be getting out around this time. We'll meet up. We meet up with them and we're hanging out outside of this church in, in Charlestown, West Virginia. And all of these little kids are wearing, wearing, they're dressed up. They have ties, they have button up shirts. And I was just thinking to myself, like, look, man. You can rag on religion and Christianity and whatever, and there's bad people of all backgrounds. But when I see a bunch of little kids dressed nicely, being polite, giggling and having a good time, and then I think about what it was like in Chicago at these public schools, I'm like, church is better for your kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. Religious schools. I, I, I wonder about this, you know, because I went to Catholic school when I was younger. And my parents, uh, who were Christian and my mom is still very Christian, said it wasn't about religion. It was about community and a good school that would raise kids right. That's why they wanted us to go there. And then eventually we, went, we, we encountered hard times. It became expensive. So public school was free. And that's what we, we opted for. But I do think it was, it was very good for me to go from, from kindergarten until the end of fifth grade at a Catholic school, which was much more rigid, and then go to public school and go, my God, like seeing what was going on in public schools was crazy. Yeah. Drugs, drinking. And these are these are middle schoolers. You were South Side, right? Yeah. Yeah. Southwest. OK. You know, so it's, it's the South Side. It's, it's rough. But it's like slightly better than the like South Side. South Side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. You, you touched on a lot. And, and 
And but there, it's not a coincidence that as America, you know, we used to we used to be a strongly Christian country, and over the past 30, 40 years, it's become more or less a secular country. And and I I think I think that's probably at the root of a lot of this is you you had stronger churches you had just the the overall culture was a christian culture and and that was the standard and 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 as we've gone away from that it's just it's a lot of chaos because there's a, we all we all we all want to be our own gods you know and being our own gods allow us to make our own rules of what's right and wrong and that's a recipe for for chaos and i think that's what we're seeing yeah I, I think a large component of the culture war is a Judeo-Christian moral framework versus no moral framework at all, yeah. or a fascistic moral framework that believes there is no truth but power. Right. And that's the, the postmodernists, that's the neo-Marxists. They, they believe they're justified in lies and mis- manipulation because the only thing that matters is whether or not you can wield power effectively. And there's some truth to that. People who have power can control people's minds and they can influence culture. And I suppose the interesting thing is, me, I believe there's a God. I believe beyond this universe, beyond us, there is something greater. And however you want to describe it, I think it is infinitely ignorant to assume humans are the end-all, be-all of, of consciousness. In which case, whether you believe in God or, 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 or not, there is likely, mathematically, something more powerful, something more uh, uh, capable, more intelligent, wherever, however, whatever. And then you have people who just genuinely do not believe that. They believe they are the center of the universe and thus their will be done. Yeah. And that is a creepy thing, yeah. in my opinion. But I say that knowing they don't believe that. And one of the mistakes I think we make when it comes to the culture war is telling someone, hey, this is wrong because of this. And in their mind, they don't care. You can say, it is creepy for you to believe you're God. And they think to themselves, ha, 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 what an idiot. Because they believe they're God. Right. They believe that we are figments of their imagination. And that's a, an extreme way to put it. But many of these people have this um, Satanist view, in a sense, of they are, you know, the, the end-all, be-all, their existence, their reality. It is about them. Yes. That's uh, Satanism. So you were explaining that your belief is that like you don't follow a structured religion, but you believe there's a God or higher power or something overall. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that is uh, deism. It's actually what many of our founding fathers who were came here as an evangelicals and um, of, of other Christian religions, all or most of them, many of them, uh, Thomas Paine, George Washington, many of them ended up go, like moving more as they were as they were building this country and writing the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, and as they were figuring out like natural rights and deciding that, many of them started gearing more toward deism. Like, okay, maybe it's not that there is a structured religion, but there is something greater than us to answer to, or something greater than us that created us. And so, it's deism is a is a that's that's a lot. What smart guys? Yeah, yeah. Um, I do think if you look at the Christian moral framework. Mm-hmm. There's obvious that you can always look back at anything and be like, look how evil it was. Mm-hmm. Anything. People talk about, you know, oh, the slave trade in the, in the United States, look how evil the founding of this country was. And then I'm like, let's go back a little bit further. Oh, how evil it was for these African nations to capture and sell off their enemies as slaves. Mm-hmm. There's evil everywhere. Let's try and get rid of that and maintain the good. And so I look at, I, I love bringing up this point because I get to, uh, challenge Bill Maher. Mm -hmm. Bill Maher, his whole worldview is a Christian moral framework. There's no question. And he doesn't understand this. He thinks he's an atheist? He is an atheist, Uh, and that's fine. But as long as he understands his moral framework is is Christian. Mm -hmm. What he doesn't understand, his view that you are innocent until proven guilty, his belief in free speech, these things are rooted in the in the Judeo-Christian moral framework. There's differences between Judaist, uh, a Jewish moral framework and Christian moral framework, but they, they heavily overlap. People in China don't have that concept of, of innocent until proven guilty. They did not develop a culture based on these biblical moral frameworks. Yeah. There are things in the Bible that we now deem very bad. You know, uh, talk about slavery and stuff. Yeah, we, we've moved beyond that. We, we, we respect the rights of humans, but we've built and retained, built upon and retained some of the best ideas. 
The easiest example I often use is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. If there's but one righteous man, this, you know, I will spare the city. And that is the root of innocent until proven guilty. That's where Blackstone's formulation originates. That's where Benjamin Franklin's quote originates. And that's how we get the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. That's how we, as the American people, protect the innocent and have created the greatest nation this, this world has ever seen. In China, which is becoming very powerful, they did not have that. They've never had that. So what do they get? Well, Chinese communism. They have feudalism, they have imperialism, and now they have Chinese communism. In their world, in, in, in their perspective, there is no innocent until proven guilty. It is, you're, you're accused of a crime, we remove you from society because you are dangerous, and then we'll figure it out. So for someone like Bill Maher to say, I believe this, that, this, and we should run these things, the woke are bad, they're cultists, and all, whatever he wants to say, I'm like, Dennis Prager called it cut flower politics, I believe. Mm -hmm. The root, the, the flower has been cut from the root and it still looks beautiful for a little bit, but then starts mm -hmm. to decay. And Bill Maher represents that in that there are so many good ideas he has that doesn't understand are unique to a Christian moral framework. And that it doesn't mean you need to believe in God, but you can certainly understand the teachings that we've chosen to keep as to why they're a good thing. And that's where I come back to. I think the church is a massive net positive in building community, bringing people together getting rid of the bad ideas and progressing with the good ideas. Here's the challenge the church has, in my opinion. This country still is majority Christian, like 70%, I think, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. They're too tolerant. <laughs> Absolutely too tolerant. And um, A lot of live and let live, yeah. And it's, it's to a certain degree, virtuous, but... But not really. <laughs> right, tolerance to a certain degree just becomes letting your child jump off a cliff. Right. So at a certain point, we say we want to love let live and respect, but you have to recognize that there will always be a red line. And if you don't enforce that, this is what you get. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If you let the devil in into the public square, then, then chaos ensues and, and the churches have not done their role. Right. Well, in, in protecting in protecting all of us and our kids and <clears throat> it's a shame. And so, yeah. So something interesting about uh, how our country's rooted in Judeo-Christian, because people will push back on that immediately and say, no, it's not. But it is, because it, yeah, the, uh, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the uh, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, all of these these things are rooted from, they took a lot of that from the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta is rooted in Judeo-Christian principles. So, and, and that was their major, um, that, that was like their outline for what they were going to do to our country was the Magna Carta. So, so, it, um, so, so that, that's a truth, you know, and people will push back against that saying it's not a Christian country, but I mean, technically you mentioned, you know, the founding fathers being deist, mm -hmm. many of them overt Christians. Mm -hmm. Obviously this country was like 99.9% .9 Christian back then. And so to say that it, it's strange to me, the, the left makes the argument that the country was intended to be secular. And it's like, no, no. I'm pretty sure there are quotes about, because uh, Seamus definitely loves to bring this up, that uh, the country is intended for a religious people or, or something like that, a, a moral... Yes, yeah. Jefferson. Yeah. Yep, Jefferson has a quote. I, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it was something about that. Like, if, if this this country will not stand if there is not a moral framework, essentially, was what Jefferson's quote was. Yeah, because there's too much freedom. Yes. And, and, you know, with right. capitalism... So you need oh. more, more... Morality is a red line. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. It, it, the red the red line shouldn't come from government. It should mm -hmm. come from our own God given conscience. Yes. And 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 so when when there isn't that, capitalism democracy turns into not very good systems. Exactly. Sludge. So when yeah. it when it comes to um, atrocities like abortion, I, I always look to Dr. Ron Paul about this. He says abortion should be unthinkable, not illegal. All right, because it should be such wow. an unthinkable tragic awful thing to happen that the government doesn't need to get involved because there's no reason to make it illegal because our our moral framework is so fixed that this is bad this is objectively bad i say it all the time laws are meaningless mm -hmm. uh the constitution unfortunately meaningless now i don't mean that in, in an absolute sense what i mean to say is the meaning of the constitution is absolutely fantastic the meaning of the Bill of Rights and many of the amendments, many of them, not all of them, mm. uh, are fantastic. The concept is brilliant, but it only works if you agree. 
if there are three people in a room, someone says, hey, if we order pizza, we all we all split the bill. You say, yes. The pizza shows up, everybody eats, and then one guy says, I ain't paying anything. What can you do about it? You can say, get out. You can say, we won't do deals with you anymore. But the reality is, the agreement you had is meaningless if people are unwilling to abide by it. We have a constitution in this country which sets forth the framework for how the country operates. We when, Typically, when we mention the constitution, it's really fascinating to me. We're talking about the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. yeah. specifically. Because the constitution has a lot of stuff in it, like here's how the executive branch operates. Yeah, We really mean the Bill of Rights, the amendments that were added to it. So it is the constitution. The amendments are completely meaningless to a society that is moving towards chaos and no moral framework. Because sooner or later, if we don't resist the breakdown, you get a knock on the door, and there's a police officer saying, you engaged in hate speech. Why? You bought a pride flag and you burned it. Mm -hmm. And then they say, because of that, you're under arrest. And you say, but it's my property. Burning flags is constitutional protected. It's like, we don't care what the Constitution says. You've offended us, and we have power. Turn around, put your hands behind your back or else. This is why you got to get to red states, for sure. I mean, pick your red state well, but blue states, that, that's going to happen in blue states. Um, it's less likely to happen in a red state. They tend to, you know, not care, not do anything, which is what conservatives can kind of be famous for is not doing anything like being a big talk, but not really walking a walk. So that's my recommendation. I did it. You should do it too. If you need I, to, I, th I think we should, uh, we can play that game. Mm -hmm. If they say that burning a pride flag is hate speech and intimidation, then burning an American flag is too, because na uh, national, a nation of origin is a protected class. There you go. So if someone is choosing to destroy an American flag, that's hate speech. You got to play their own game better than them. That's how you beat them. You know, in the end, I think if you own a flag, you should be allowed to burn it mm, yeah, just safely. Sure. Like, it's funny when the left tries to burn an American flag in the middle of the street and the cops stop, you know, stop them from doing it. And they're like, this is protected under the Constitution. It's like, no, 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 you misunderstand. Not in a public space where you are threatening the lives of other people by starting large fires. Yes, right. exactly. Perhaps on, on, on your own property where you're legally allowed to have fires, you can burn your own property within reason. Because there's even laws against, I'm pretty sure it might be illegal to burn a flag because of the chemicals that are in it. Mm -hmm. You know, dyes or whatever they use or the synthetics and stuff it's, like that. It's all about getting that clip of the cops stopping them from yeah. burning the flag for level one thinkers who don't realize that they're being stopped because they're going to start a fire and kill people. In a public I, space. I, I think um, one thing that should start happening is parents should sue schools that have pride imagery in the classroom and say these symbols are antagonistic and offensive to Christians and Christians are a protected class. I think Florida parents can push back on things. I'm not sure if that's one of them, but Florida parents are able to. In Massachusetts, there is a kid who wore a shirt that said there are two, there are two genders. Mm, saw that. And they said, you can't wear that because it's offensive to people of different gender identities. He didn't insult anybody. He stated his, uh, 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 he stated a scientific fact. Yeah. Now, granted, they changed the definition of gender. You can make it mean whatever you want to mean. But why is that offensive to anybody? Okay, if that's the case, if they say this innocuous statement is offensive, I say the pride flag is offensive. But the problem is conservatives just play defense. Mm -hmm. So they wear the shirt smugly smile and then get sued and then told to take the shirt off and i'm like sue them make them take their the, the judge ruled the kid can't wear the shirt until the c case is settled it's like okay in the meet i would demand to the judge then any other symbols that are deemed offensive by christians be removed from the class as well mm -hmm. and i guarantee you you can get one million signatures from christians saying pride flags are offensive yeah overnight i'd be willing to bet if i went right now and said fill out this form if you're a cr christian who finds pride imagery offensive then here you go your honor here's one million people i think that warrants this is offensive to a protected class i mean it's bastardizing the covenant with god that's exactly my point mm -hmm. yeah i mean yeah, exactly they, they've taken they've taken god's covenant with man and turned it into you know celebrating gay sex yeah exactly that's offensive but christians I mean, don't do anything about it right right so so what is the best way for conservatives to start being on the offense i mean i i think we we have to engage with our kids and we have to teach them the values that's what brave books is doing and we have to build our own communities but what else like like how else do we take the country back if they for come for you you come for them so it's so it's about more than just 
being a great parent and having a community, it's like if the outsiders come for you, then you go for the outsiders. While also, you know, minding your business, taking care of your family and doing your community and all of that. But you got to you gotta stop the outsiders and, and hit them back because that's a lot of, we mind our business, which is wonderful, but also- Lawsuits, yeah, elections, lawsuits. I mean, these people are determined. They, 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 I don't, I don't know what happened, but you have a left that is driven by this vitriolic rage and you have a complacent traditional class. I don't even like to say conservative because what we're seeing on the culture war is disaffected liberals. Yeah. You know, uh, even Bill Maher is now more and more complaining about the left and he's a secular guy. So I think ultimately you have to we're starting to see it though i i'm i'm not saying any of this to be like oh the end is nine we're doomed i actually feel fairly optimistic especially with what you guys are doing clearly there is a red line and people have been pushed up against the wall and they're starting to get angry about it you got to sue you can't just be sued you know is or, or or you know what they're doing is in massachusetts they're suing saying the kid can wear this how did it get to the point where the kid was told not to in the first place why do you have to sue it's because you don't sue so be proactive. I say, anybody who hears this, if your kids are in a school with pride flags, file the lawsuit now. Reach out to like America First Legal or something. There, there are tons of nonprofits that will sue and say, this symbol is, a, and in fact, you can even approach it another way. The rainbow is a religious iconography. Mm. It is God's covenant. And them putting it in the schools is a violation of separation of church and state. I like that. Now it's, uh oh, no, this is the pride flag. It means uh, Bible. It, it was a symbol of God's covenant and you're sneaking it in. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't need to do that. I think you should outright just say it's an offensive symbol because it appropriates God's covenant as an insult to Christians. Yeah. And if they don't, if they say we disagree, be like, it doesn't matter if you agree or not. That kid was told he can't wear the two genders shirt by a judge. Judge says you can't wear it. Now it's pending, but he says while it's pending, you can't wear it. I say, okay, if the basis for which you cannot wear a shirt is someone got offended, take them pride flags down right now. You can't play that game. And unfortunately, this kid and his family and the legal team, their, their mentality is, we don't complain when you put up the pride flag because you're allowed to believe what you want. And I'm like, no, 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 no. No complain. The schools should not be putting up religious iconography. I view the pride flag as religious. It is a non-theistic religion. It has all the tenets of religion. It has the structures of religion. And just because you say, but it's not. Sorry, you can't play that game. When the schools tried to introduce creationist curriculum, they said, no, it's religious. Nothing about creationism is religious. In fact, it could be simulist. It is, the, it is a scientific perspective. The universe is, in fact, a simulation, in which case the concept of basic creation is a scientific thesis. Nope, it's banned. It's religious. Okay, well then, pride, Marxism, all that stuff, religion, get it out of the schools. CRT, etc. cetera. I don't know. It seems like, seems like fighting on their turf is a losing battle and and the pub, public education system you know they've been captured and I, I i think we need to i think we need to be in we need to be innovative and come up with just redesign redesign things redesign schools redesign communities um i mean like there's all sorts of there, there's i don't know how we're still doing school the same way and that there's not options you know but like states should should support entrepreneurship in schools. You know, like there's all sorts of ideas. I, I, I've got an idea for what I think is be an awesome school. Like you, 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 it's like a mix between Hogwarts, homesteading and military training. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm following. <laughs> yeah. you, you break kids up into like four, four houses. You get a plot of land, four acres or so. And all right, this house is responsible for this acre and you, they've got their animals, their, their farm and, and their, they engage in some commerce and, and they're competing sort of against the other houses. And, and oh, that's a great idea. And then, and then, you know, in, engaging in, in some military tactics, training, physical, you know, bo especially boys, you know, yes. I, I, it would be all boys, um, science contests. You think only an all boys school? I think you could do. Well, I, I think boys need to be around each other and boys and girls are different and, and you, you could do girls, something very similar, mm -hmm. but maybe not so physical and military type stuff. No, right. Yeah. I, I, I like the idea. It's brilliant. I think, I think it should be a co-ed school, but I think you can have boys and girls programs. So it's like the boys at this time will go and do this training. The girls at this time will, will go and do this kind of training, but they still socially interact, you know, yeah, so, parameters. So maybe, maybe there's girls in their own 
houses, you know, or like, like Hogwarts, you know, like Hogwarts. Yeah. 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 Actually, did they do? No, thought, n- no, they were mixed. They were mixed. Um, in the video game, they're not mixed. Oh, really? Yeah. In the video game, you have to choose which, which, which dorm you go and the boys and girls are separate. Huh? Boys. I thought they were mixed. Maybe it's the movies that did them that way. But I just want to say this. You'll get the millennials. You know, you do. You set it up and you call it Hogwarts. You don't call it military training. You call mm-hmm. it defense against the dark arts. Yes. And then you go to millennial <laughs> urban liberal parents and say, it's like a Hogwarts thing. The kids are sorted. We don't really have a sorting hat. That's not possible. But it's a fun experience where the kids get to you can put it in AI. AI could sort them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have them answer personality tests yeah. and then they get sorted into different uh, uh, houses. Yeah. And you, you call it the Hogwarts experience or you say it's not Hogwarts because, you know, it's copyrighted. But we want kids to have a summer camp experience where they get to be like they're going to Hogwarts and it's not real magic. But, you know, the defense against the dark arts will be like, we'll teach the kids a little taekwondo, a little karate and You're stuff. learn the Bible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You um, can't bring that to the millennial parent. <laughs> magic right. book. The magic book. Right. The magic book. There will be there will be magic books and things like that. <laughs> yeah. But then you'll get millennial parents be like, oh, that sounds like so much fun. And then what's actually happening is whether you get the Bible in there or not, yeah. you give kids a structure, you give them obedience. I think it's a good way to actually get liberal parents to bring their kids out to something that may introduce these traditional moral values without being so overt. Summer camp. Yeah. Two months, you get sorted into one of four houses. <laughs> they play sports against each other. They they still interact with each other. Nobody's, we're trying to make anybody against each other, but they have their team basically and they get a plot of land. They can learn how to garden and there'll be animals and it'll be so much fun. And then when the kids come there, they get, they get, real moral life training yeah yeah i mean that's a good the, idea well there's all sorts of opportunities like that for just creativity and building new things and and to me you know that's what we're trying to do at brave books and 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 um i just think it's a it's a better way to go about it than i don't know it's like it's like yeah i, I want to care for kids that are in public schools because i grew up in a public school you know you don't want to just forgo that but it seems like a losing battle at least for the time being t- until you know there's there's a spiritual revival across the country that that changes all these institutions. It was uh, Dr. Peterson who had talked about this in uh, one of his clips that I watched. Said boys should be playing all the time to the point of exhaustion. Yes, I agree. every single day. Um, and so at this point, they, he was saying schools are structured all wrong for boys. He goes, boys need to play like sun up to sundown constantly, like roughhousing a touching running like everything and uh he said but instead people are like oh my child has adhd <laughs> Drug him up. You, you know and so they they put him on drugs yeah. and and instead of just and then they're like i bet your child doesn't have adhd this is what dr peterson said he's like i bet you your child can sit in front of a video game and play that straight through with yep. no interruptions because they don't they don't have adhd they just need to be a boy yeah i think uh Schools are trash. Mm. And uh, if I was going to structure some kind of learning facility, it would be, there's gotta be games. It's not about, play the video game, have fun, you walk away. It's about, this child must learn strategic thinking, forward thinking. So chess is a bit rudimentary. I don't know if I would advocate for something like that. But I do think a variety of games would be very, very good for kids. Uh, Pokemon cards. Excellent for children. Very, it's great. You have to plan ahead. You have to think about what your opponent has in his cards. And Pokemon's very popular. So it's a great opportunity to teach kids uh, about probabilities, to teach them about strat- strategic thinking, and again, forward thinking. Schools are all the same. Sit down, read the book, do the homework. Take the standardized test. Yeah, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah. It's, not, it's not helping anybody become uh, a, a well-rounded person. If this country took every child and started teaching, first of all, in this country, we skip ages zero through five, which is psychotic. Those are, those, those are the most important years of a human being's life. And what do we do? Nothing. They just hang around with mom and they put them in front of the iPad and they ignore them. Kids should be learning the moment they can learn whatever they can learn. They should be, you know, teach them. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking kids are stupid. They're not stupid. They're ignorant. Because it takes a long time to learn and gather information and then connect the dots of the information, which is wisdom. That means a child who is four years old is not stupid. You just have to give them that information. 
And it's always remarkable to me when people say, say things like, well, they're too young to learn that. I'm like, no, they're not. They're, they, it may take them a long time to figure things out, but you have to start immediately with like A, B, C, D. You don't wait until they've experienced the world. You gotta, you, so we skip that. But I think if this country gave every kid in school uh, physical, like gym is, is nonsense. We need actual physical play. Dodgeball is so much fun. Not everybody likes dodgeball. Some kids don't like it. You got to figure out what they do like. And you've and and kids have to be given structure. So there, if there's a kid who's like, I don't want to do it, be like, we're gonna you're gonna do something. If you don't want to play the game, let's get some jumping jacks, get some push ups, and you make the kid do it. Not to the point where the kids hurt or anything like that. You just you have to understand, kids don't know, and so you say, you don't want to play dodgeball. Totally get it. Can be stressful for a lot of people. Jumping jacks. Now, let's do. Uh, um, I forgot a lot of these things are called. Make them run laps. Yeah. And it's it's like it to many of these liberals running laps sounds like punishment. And I'm like, no, have them go for a run. Find out what they like. Are they an individualist? Do they like skateboarding? Do they like martial arts? Do they like team sports? Find it. Then you want strategic games. It's not just about to the point of physical exhaustion, mental exhaustion. That kid, the, there, there should be an hour every day of kids doing physical activity and then doing mental activity. Imagine what school would be like if you were like, all right. At noon, we're all going to go out and play some sport. It's not going to be go do whatever you want. Recess. It's going to be literally, we're going to find games to play. Then when you're back, it's Pokemon card time. Kids would be like, dude, so cool. Like, wow, they'd be so excited. And then you got all the kids in the room learning strategy, forward thinking, and memory. How many cards are in your deck? You can have four of each card. You've drawn two of that card. You have two cards left. There's 50 cards left in your deck. What's the probability that card's going to come up and you're going to win this turn? Yeah. That's the stuff you learn when you're playing games like this. Yeah, and, and you also learn the social aspects of it too. Yep. You, you, you can't go and celebrate in front of everybody's faces. You have to be a gracious winner and, and loser. And, 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 and to me, just to piggyback on that, one thing I think is super valuable that we teach our, our youth is just the pr practical knowledge. Things like you know, how to fix things around the house, how, yep. to, how to get your hands dirty, how to... Um, like my kids, I'm, I'm, I really want to teach them how to be in touch with the land, you know, that, to, to, to how to grow things, how to raise chickens and animals and things like that. I mean, that's, that's so healthy. We used to kids. do that, but you know, what's crazy is that, um, the funny thing about sex ed is that it used to be decently simpler in that kids grew up on a farm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, oh, we've seen yeah. that happen. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, parents would protect their kids to a certain degree and then eventually be like, you know, your kids grow up, they, they generally understand this. And so it wasn't as shocking to a kid to first hear when you're exposed to these animals. But think about how crazy that is. Wasn't it up until I think like the early 1900s, the average, uh, on, on average, a family had one cow? Yeah. You had a cow. You had your family cow. And, and you got milk. And then you'd be like, who's got a bull? And then... They'd come and the bull would sire your cow and then you'd get milk mm -hmm. and then you get another cow and then you could, you have two cows now and the cow just eats the grass. Yeah. I mean, and there's so many benefits there. One, typically, you know, from my understanding of, of our, our culture in like the 1800s where everybody was doing a little bit of farming and homesteading, it forced community because not everybody could have the full on thing. So you were borrowing, you were borrowing goats to make, you know, and so yep. it, it, it creates community for kids they're they have some responsibility that's meaningful you know like a, a cow that's a life that that you're responsible for and, and kids can play a role in that to go milk it to, you know to pick up the eggs to to, to and, and there's and you're just in touch with nature in touch with reality and um it's so it's it's a it's a great way to learn just getting your hands dirty i wonder if we should also have at a certain age you know that they, they do that thing where they give the kid an egg and it's like, protect your egg for a week. Oh, yeah. I did that in uh, health. health yeah. Did that, yeah. I think they should actually be like, we're going to incubate an egg and you're going to have a chick. <gasps> oh, my God. And mm -hmm. guess what? Sadly, some chicks may die. We had a baby chick just die. Aww. Nothing we could have done about it. We are very good to our chickens. They have they, These are these are chickens. These are 1% of chickens. This is a point one. These, these chickens are like the billionaires of the chicken world. <laughs> chicken city, gated walls, automatic door. There's nothing more you could do to live People can... Them. Watch Charmed them online. They're, they're, it's a show that the food comes down. But so we had these babies uh, that we hatched and one died. The uh, Cochin, we have chicken. It's a fluffy, short little chicken. 
brooded and hatched, I think, two eggs. And they're not her babies, but she did it anyway because she had the eggs and then she hatched them. And now there's two little babies running around. It's great. And um, then the silkies had four babies. Three of them died. Mm. We let the silkies do their thing. They hatched some babies. The babies were born. And then three of them, three of them ended up dying. That was entirely on the chickens. You have kids raise some chicks. Some will die. And then I think, you know what you do if the chick dies? You incubate and raise another one. The, teach these kids the responsibility of protecting life, of, of what you need to protect that life. And I, I imagine this. For one, obviously, I love chickens because they're hilarious. They're so funny. Yeah. They're just goofy little, they're, they're great pets. And uh, they give you eggs. But you have a kid who hatches their own baby chick. It's theirs. There's an emotional attachment to it, as there should be. You gotta get food. Baby chick needs water and food. If you don't get it to them, they're gonna die. Where do you get it? Then you attach that to some kind of responsibility with the school or whatever program the kid is doing. We're not just gonna give you the food. If you need the food, like upon completing this test, we will. Obviously, there's you know you have to have some kind of emergency fail safe. We're not gonna let the baby chick starve, <laughs> but you've got to be like you you can't just have free food. Yeah, that's good. and they're gonna say, but my chick is hungry. It's crying, and be like. Take the test, finish it, I'll give you the, or sweep the floor, I'll give you the food. My daughter's school has a 4-H program that does this. Oh, uh, it's that's middle cool. school. Yep, middle school. So her best friend, uh, all year, raised a pig. Um, <laughs> and every day, her and every morning and every night, her mom would have to bring her to the place where the pig was, because the pig, was, the pig stays on its farm. But it's the daughter's responsibility. The daughter would go every day, feed the pig, uh, twice a day, every day. And that was like, it was such a responsibility because... I mean, they really couldn't not do it. You know, the, the pig would suffer. Yeah. Um, so so at the end of this year where she took care of the pig, she had to bring it to the fair and sell it to be a meat pig. No. Oh. She <laughs> named it. I mean, it was everything. But it, so, so they do that. They also, though, do it with rabbits and chickens where yeah. you don't have to have to do that. You know, yep. like you actually get to keep the rabbits and the chickens that you raise at the end of the year. Rabbits are hard to keep as pets. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But those are. So she's going to be getting into this 4-H um, in eighth grade, which is what she's going into, and she's going to do it too. We're not doing a pig, but I was thinking of doing chickens. Chickens are good. Mm -hmm. What's funny is every rural conservative who's listening to this is laughing. Mm -hmm. They're like, what do you mean have them learn how to raise chickens in school? The kids have already raised 500 chickens at our, <laughs> in our backyard as it is. Yeah. We're on like, you know, or, or we've got 12 chickens already and we've already incubated for this year. Kids who live out in the country, you don't need to teach them that they learned it already. Yep. I, I, I genuinely think the problem that we have right now is cities have become plague infested garbage holes mm -hmm. and the policies of these, these, these politicians, whether intentional or not, are destroying them, um, Democrats. And uh, it's unfortunate, but I don't, I don't know what there is to be done. I mean, the way a human being should live is, is more uh, reflected in conservative rural lifestyles than it is in urban environments. 100%. We're not meant to live in clouds of brake dust. Mm -hmm. You know, Ian brings up all the time, inhaling all this garbage and brake dust and dirt and grime and oil and chemicals. You can't produce food in a city. Uh-uh. Yeah. And think about maybe, like- maybe, maybe, maybe garden on your roof if you're wealthy enough to have a roof access. Yeah, and these kids don't touch grass ever. Seriously. They're, it's, They're it's, not grounded. It's a concrete jungle. There's no grass to touch. And this is so, so important. Like, I mean, it's, like, I guess I was, I was raised in like a rural area. So I had like huge, like acre yard and I was grass. I was like an outdoor kid, you know, but, and, and my kids are also outdoor kids. It was such a blessing to be able to, to have that. But I mean, even as an adult, I go outside I take my shoes off. I touch grass and it's just like, you're just rooted yeah. in it. Uh, you, you were touching on something in the beginning where you, you were saying that this trans movement may have something to do with our endocrine system. Yeah. Would you mind talking more about that? I mean, because... Like the I, plastics I, I, and stuff? Yeah, I yeah. know our testosterone levels are dropping. Oh, yeah. I think it's plastics. Um, we had James Lindsay on, Tim Cast IRL, and he said, there's no such thing as a trans kid. And I said, I disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, you know, however you want to define it, there are kids who are experiencing gender, gender dysphoria or social uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria, social whatever. There are people... I think Blair White was asked, when did she know she was trans? And she said, she was a very, very little kid. You know, and it was just apparent to her. And, um, you know, that, that, that gets me thinking about, obviously, there are social pressures. 
I think that is a very large component of this, especially among young girls who are looking for likes and social validation more so than boys may be. But, you know, both boys and girls seek social validation. I think girls just a little bit more than boys. What we do know, and we've known for a long time, because I've been reading about this since I was a teenager, birth controls in the drinking water mm -hmm. in cities. It gets through the filtration systems. And it's in, it's in the water in trace amounts or something, that, mm -hmm. something like that. We know that phthalates, um, PCBs, which is poly... Um, Polycarbonate. Uh, polychloral biphenols or something like that. I don't know. But what it is... Are you sure? Serge is saying I'm, I'm right. I'm like, okay, I don't know. It's like- Thanks, I'm, Serge. Yeah, I know about phthalates. When did plastic start becoming ubiquitous? End of the 60s, into the 70s, we started seeing more and more plastic products. I went to an antique store and it's all the stuff from the 50s is metal and glass. You're not getting these chemicals into your system. Here's what I see happening. With the expansion of plastics in every facet of life, Everything we drink, everything we eat is wrapped in it. We know that endocrine disruptors, chemicals are leaching into our foods. Enter the 80s. You get the parents, the boomers of the millennial generation. The first generation to have subsisted off of plastic entrenched products are now getting pregnant and consuming foods laced with endocrine disruptors. Brings you to the millennial generation. You see this uptick in... LGBTQ and trans and these things. Then you get Gen Xers. They're having kids, which is Gen Z. There's an overlap. I know it's, 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 it's a wave. It's not, it's not analog. But you'll get between the baby boomers and the, and the Gen Xers, Gen Z, which is absolute saturation of these endocrine disrupting chemicals in our food supply, in our water. And now you see Gen Z being very heavily LGBTQ or whatever. Many uh, uh, on the right and um, the culture war right, but also disaffected liberals immediately say social. And I say probably a large component, but we've known endocrine disruptors do this for decades. We have known there are studies you can read that says certain birth control was mascul masculinize masculinizing female fetuses. And they found that women who took a certain birth control who had daughters had like an eight times higher chance of that daughter being a lesbian. The introduction of that birth control is new. It just happened. Hmm. So we have to reconcile with that fact that uh, endocrine disorders likely are. I mean, look, we've got, I'm, I'm looking right now at our, at, our, at our stock bar. Everything's plastic. Granted, the booze is all glass bottles. We yeah. get the good stuff. But uh, we've got honey sticks, plastic tubes, can, uh, candy wrappers, plastic wrappers, vitamins, plastic bottles. All that stuff leaches in. Yeah. And then... That has an impact on fetal development. So why is it the testosterone is dropping? This is probably a huge component of it. It, it, it. it can't just be that all of a sudden humans started to evolve to not have testosterone. Right. The, the Try Guys, the famous BuzzFeed video from 10 years ago or however long it was, where these four guys get their T levels checked and they have the testosterone of 80-year-old men. Shocking. Yeah. It's a combination of, in my opinion, endocrine disruptors, but also... There is a social component. Screens and just being in the state. You know. Not exercising, yeah. not eating meat. All, testosterone is heavily tied to fat consumption and exercise. So if you're eating a lot of fat, you're eating a lot of protein and working out, your body has more testosterone. That plays a role too. So social elements there for sure. Guys who want social validation aren't getting it so much from being ripped and being strong. That still does exist, but it's now from weird social behaviors. We yeah. have uh, social media behaviors. We now have, you know, hey, you can be famous and successful if you prance around and shake your butt and do kink stuff and drag stuff. So obviously there are guys who are seeking validation in that direction. But I do believe a large component comes from chemical saturation in the food products that we consume. So can And big pharma. Can endocrine yeah. disruptors like disruption be undone or is it like nope you're permanently like it may this. be permanent yeah so that's, that's but we can right. reverse that trend by uh so you'll notice that all the waters that we have glass bottles glass bottles mm -hmm. we do have plastic bottles don't get me wrong we have because uh we but i i always tell people like when it comes to the water in this studio and the mm -hmm. stuff that i drink filtered it's it's double nine stage filtered glass bottles I love it. I am interrupting my endocrine <laughs> as yeah. we speak with my smart water. <laughs> but it's, it's not absolute. I yeah, don't. I, I, I think it's subtle. I, yeah. I think what we're looking at is not that plastic is guaranteed to make a child trans. Mm -hmm. It's that if you have 100 million human beings born 
and the endocrine disruption rate is 0 0.02. You're going to get some. You're going to have tens of thousands. Yeah. Well, I mean, 0 0.02, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of people who are going to be gender non-binary or something like that or, or be atypical in their in their sexual development. You know what's weird about the cross between like liberals and conservatives? Liberals used to be the earthy, crunchy, like stay away from the chemicals, right. the GMOs. <laughs> and now they're like, Switch. inject me with this, this, <laughs> you know, like it, it's it's incredible. Just, Big it, pharma me, daddy. Exactly. And then you get, then you get uh, conservatives and libertarians and they have chicken farms and right. they source but their own meat. chicken farms. Yeah. But I'll just say they, they, they do all these things that otherwise, that, that are I'm, more organic, I guess. It is crazy to me. You know, you look at the conservatives of 10 or 15 years ago, and there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. They were much more industrialist. And you had a lot of leftist hippies. The liberals were very capitalist, too. Don't get me wrong. The Democrats, of course, they were just, you know, I don't know. They, 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 they still do feign that environmental stuff. But it's fascinating that in the past few years, you get it's. It used to be the hippy dippy leftists who were anti vaxxers. Yes, exactly. And they were like, I know better than to me, and you know, and now now it's like conservative MAGA hat wearing rural <laughs> people being like, I don't trust big pharma. You know, yeah. but but I do think the the reason that is is because Trump ignited a large portion of the country who didn't normally vote. And these are regular salt of the earth people and, and working class people, so that they don't trust these big companies. And especially when it comes to to uh, big pharma, the opioid crisis devastated west virginia and many of these these uh pop, these these communities so they're not trusting of it the this is why i was, I was on twitter the other day i called tom morello a fascist <laughs> because fascist means bad guy yeah. um the left will call you or anyone else a fascist it's meaningless but tom morello posted this meme where he was like in germany they say if nine if nine nazis are sitting at a table and one person who's not a nazi is there you have 10 nazis or whatever and i'm like oh so he's a fascist because he's associated with corporatists and authoritarians. He's promoted massive government control and, and uh, no bid, no liability contracts for major multinational corporations. So if we're going the, the lucrative merger of corporation and state fascist route, that's him. And then I get these lefties being like, you're wrong. Fascism isn't that. I'm like, I don't care what you say, dude. You're, I you're, you're, I've seen what makes you cheer. All the time for being a libertarian, which just. It's nonsense. <laughs> so I just say, look. If you can call anybody a fascist and it just means bad guy, Tom Morello is certainly that. <laughs> but we're talking about a guy who's in a, who, who, who started a band called Rage Against the Machine. Yeah. And I love the mindless cult-like mentality of liberals in that I criticize Tom Morello. And the response I get is, it's funny how conservatives don't know what these songs are about. It's like, yeah. dude, I can play those songs on the guitar. <laughs> I, grew up, I know what he's saying when he's saying killing in the name of. And when he calls the police the chosen whites, I know all about that. That's why I grew up punk rock and traditionally liberal and actually for a while very far left because I'm like racism is bad. But here's the thing. When I say racism is bad and then y'all come out and create POC rooms and non-POC room. I'm like, you are exactly what I was talking about mm -hmm. when I said racism was bad. So when you come out and you say some of those that run forces are the same that burn crosses. And I'm like, yep. I know all about that. And then when I say we want to end racial prejudice and segregation, and you bring out Derek Bell, who writes a book that says discrimination is a good thing. That's, that's what he claims. I'm like, y'all are the bad guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. They just, they, 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 here's the problem for conservatives and people in the culture war right. They assume that when the left said racism is bad, there was an agreement we should not, that we should, th they thought the agreement was, I have a dream that one day my four little children will be judged based on the content of the character, not the color of their skin. No, this is a mistake. I learned this the hard way. I know a lefty guy. He told me, because we were, we, we had, you know, associated with each other back during Occupy. I was like, what happened, man? You used to support free speech. And he goes, no, no, you, you misunderstand. We knew that you did and we exploited you because we wanted to shift the narrative in our direction. So if you were attacking the establishment, we were on your side. Now that the estab we have gained establishment power, you are threatening our control. So when the left said we oppose racism, what they were really talking about was structures of Judeo-Christian moral framework and values. And now that that's starting to erode, those of us that were actually talking about people disparaging others based on race are seeing that. They're saying, no, 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 no. The, the left does want to segregate based on race. <laughs> they were using us and those of us that believed in true meritocracy, individuality, who believe that all people are created equal. Those were lies. They didn't really believe that. They just saw us as a means to an end to subvert the system so they can enact their version of it.
Yeah. They that's why they changed the definitions. That's why. So you know. Well, I've got a question for you. Sure. So we started off talking a little bit about the target stuff. Um, I so when I saw the Bud Light thing, um, my assumption. Well, one, it was super cool to see the Christian conservatives boycott and re- really hurt, you know, their their pocketbooks. And I was like, okay, this is this is the path. And then I see Target and Ford just sort of voluntarily step in front of the conservative <laughs> sh- shooting squad. Yeah. And but so that just that blew my mind because they had to know what was going to happen, but they did it anyway. And then uh, I saw a thread. I didn't finish all of it as long, but it, it was really good where you were talking about ESG scores. And, and I was like, is there like a second form of currency that's starting to be developed in in the way of like social, 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 yeah, social the woke, scores? Yeah, exactly. the woke credit score. Yeah. So so I, my thought about this as you explained it to me is uh, so Bud Light's getting all the flack, right? So so they all have, as I wrote in that thread, they all have to meet these demands by the um, the the HRC who sends these lobbyists out with these demands that you need to meet these demands or, you know, we're going to take your funding. We're going to take your advertisers. Like nobody's going to do business with you. We're going to, we're going to penalize anybody who works with you. Right. So Bud Light is getting all the flack from this because Mm -hmm. this is, they have to do it. They have to abide by that or they don't exist. Right. But then at the same time they abide by it and they lose their customers and they don't exist. right? Right, Right. So there's just no winning, but they're trying to comply to, to hope that maybe they'll survive. So I think as Bud Light is in the public getting all of this flack, Ford and Target are like, okay, I think now's a good time. Yeah. Now's a good time to jump out there because like eh, the attention is on Bud Light, but that's not how it works. Everybody pays attention to everything. And um, yeah. as the Tim had said last night on IRL, he pulled up um, the stocks, right? So Bud Bud Light or Budweiser, Anheuser Busch, right? Yeah. So Anheuser Busch, their stock, you know, going and then. The Dylan Mulvaney stuff happens mm-hmm. and it drops a little, but then it goes back up because as Tim said, he's like, okay, well, these people are thinking um, and we're going to buy at the dip because boycotts don't work, right? And then, you know, they keep going and uh, Anheuser-Busch keeps pushing it and pushing it and then it just plummets, right? Mm-hmm. Target, that didn't happen. They just dropped off. There was no buy the dip at all yeah. because they realized perhaps boycotts work now you know so so it's interesting we're kind of in uncharted waters with that so but, but what's the motivation for target and ford you know are, for are them they, to come out at that time or yeah for them to be yeah doing so this? so are, are they hoping to please the big banks for you know future access to like cheap debt or I something i think that they were well all the attention was on budweiser i think they were hoping that they could come out and meet their demands while everybody was distracted by bud light and they could come out and be, um, come out and come out and have these these uh this this woke agenda. Okay. While the attention was on Bud Light, because everybody has to do it. All the big I, corporations that identify as American have I, to do I, it. I think while that HRC stuff and ESG all that stuff does play a big role in this, access to capital mm-hmm. is is tied to ESG and things like that. Yeah. I really do think it's just. People have mentioned Target's been doing the pride display for a long time, like 10 years or whatever. Right. I think it was the tucking stuff right. that got people and the baby outfits right. with the pride stuff. But it's become socially normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and every year, every pride month, what I think happens is you have institutional capture where woke ideology is intentionally pushing this. And this the problem is that I think the right doesn't shock the system. So what happens is Right now, you have these policies in, in businesses, like uh, we were reading about Dallas doing this. The government says you have to use someone's pronouns. In New York State, I believe state, I, I know for, well, let's just say city, because I know for a fact I've read this, the city human rights code. You must use someone's pronouns. But pronouns are only used t- t- pr- typically when someone's not near you. Like when I'm talking to you, I don't say, he, he, would, he would like, like, what? <laughs> what you, I'm right here, dude. Mm-hmm. But when you're not around, I would say, oh, Trent was over. He was saying X. To use someone's pronouns is to is talk is only when they're not around. It makes no sense. Now it's possible you could be near me and I can you can say something like, "Hey, are there any staplers?" And then I can go, "Oh, hey, Josie, do you have a stapler?" Uh, Trent was asking for it. He's looking for. Uh, uh, he's trying to finish a paper, some paperwork. You might be an earshot of it, but typically when someone's talking about you, right. what happens is people don't experience the pronoun thing all that often. They may experience a person who's non-binary or whatever, and they're told to say she, her, or whatever, or they, them, and they go. Okay, whatever, it doesn't really f- affect me. 
But where this goes is increasingly more extreme. What the what the what what is happening is that our culture is being shifted incrementally in ways that are not seemingly unreasonable. And while there are conservatives who are like, it, it is unreasonable, I will not use your pronouns. Most people are like, I don't want the conflict. So the conservatives need to introduce it to them. Instead of saying something like, I'm not using your pronoun, what happens is, we'll, we'll put it this way. You have a jury and it will be maybe the guy committed the crime. Let's just get out of here. The jury room, they say, look, it seems like he's guilty. Can we all just say guilty and go home? And one guy goes, no. And they say, look, just say he's guilty. Social pressure. Just do it. It's easier. I remember when I was a kid, we were uh, hanging out at this, there's like a construction site off of this main busy road. And we were skating around and some guy walks up to me and my friends. and He's got a walkie talkie and he goes, turn around, hands against a car now. And I was like, who are you? And then my friends go, shut up, just do it. Just do it. And I'm like, what? Who is this guy? <laughs> and he goes, don't back, don't back talk. Hands against the, the car now. And they both look at me and go, Tim, do it. And I'm like, fine. And then the guy starts laughing. He goes, you guys are idiots. Yeah. He was a construction worker. He wasn't a cop. <laughs> so what happens is people fearing conflict will say, let me just give in. They don't want to resist. Okay. Let's, if you want to play the game, we'll play the game. If you are a conservative, a li uh, disaffected liberal, libertarian, anti-woke, whatever, and you're in a workplace where they've mandated this stuff through DEI, Tell the DEI instructor during your training that your pronouns are glob globadon. <laughs> and they'll say, what was that? Glob globadon globadon self. <laughs> it makes me feel good. And, and, and here's, the, here's the reality. You know it'll make you feel good to say it, right? It's, it, it's asserting yourself. And if they ask you, why do you want those pronouns? You say, it makes me feel like I matter. It makes me feel like you will respect what I'm asking of you. And that's a true statement. When you're at work and they're telling you you have to do something, you say, okay, then I want you to do it too. Don't disrespect me. It makes me feel bad. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to have coworkers being like, Globadon self? I can't remember that. I'm not saying that. And then you can be like, you will be fired unless you do. Shock the framework. If you let them slowly push everybody, what's going to happen is you're going to be like, I don't want to say Z. And they'll be like, just say it so we can go home. I don't want to waste time here. Okay. Make it, make it hard for them to do that. Make your coworkers say, you know what? This new pronoun policy is insane. I can't remember. Globadibidi Don. I don't know it. My, my pronouns are tuna nana shabada pressure and bad calf care. And next no rest itself. And if they say, those are not real pronouns. But like, yes, they are. They make me feel valid. When you say that, it makes me feel like I actually have some control in my life. True statement. Mm -hmm. If they're coming to you and trying to take the power from you to force you to say something you don't want, Tell them you want them to say something they don't want. Use, to the truest extent, their own policies. But here's what happens. As I stated, the average person will say, just say she, she, her, they, them, he, her. Well, it's not that hard. We don't want to be fighting about it. We just want to go home. Uh-oh. I can't remember next null rest self. Practice. No, that's too much work for me. You're ma make it more difficult to engage in the policy than it is to, to just go along with it. And then you'll get regular people pro protesting and complaining and saying, I, you can't punish me for this. I don't understand what's happening. Yeah. Only way to do it. So that's interesting that the city of New York has that because that's compelled speech to force somebody to say that's something. Right. That's compelled speech. So it's, so it's the city of New York. So that's a government. That's a local government saying, you we're compelling your speech and you need tell to them, abide by it. Tell them your pronoun is... Uh, Something they don't want to say, you know, mm -hmm. like I say, glob be down or whatever. It's like, no, say it's, you know, give them, give them something like that. They're going to be like, ooh, master, <laughs> your majesty, majesty, <laughs> yep. my liege. It's, my it's spelled liege. M I L E E J. It's like, I'm not going to call you my liege. Be like, you just, my you liege. have to. Yes. My pronoun. No, you're, you're confusing the, the English words, my and liege with my liege. Mm hmm. M-I-L-E-E-J, my liege. Just yeah. say it. You have to. And then they're going to be uncomfortable. Be like, I am not calling you that. Imagine you have somebody. Oh, oh, here's a good one for you guys. You work with someone you don't like, right? You're in an office and like, oh, old catty Deborah. Tell her from now on she has to call you your majesty. Or my liege. My liege is good. Lord. Mm -hmm. 
And she's going to be like, I am not calling you that. And be like, I'll go to HR right now and say you won't use my pronoun. <laughs> From now, in New York, you can have any name you want. Regardless of what's on your ID, it is protected. Tell them your name is Lord. Lord John King. <laughs> Call me King. That's my name now. And they'll say no. And be like, if you don't, I will report you for not respecting my gender identity. And when they say, then do it. Say, okay. And you don't got to be specific. You go to HR and say, I told them my pronouns and they yelled at me. Mm -hmm. And they told me no and they insulted me. And if it happens again, I will sue you. And they will freak out. And they'll go to the person and say, I don't care what the pronouns are. He was saying king. And so I don't care. Mm -hmm. It is policy. You have to do it. It is, it is the law. And then the person you absolutely don't like working with, who is mean and rude to you, is going, here are your documents, king. <laughs> and you go, thank you, yeah. servant. <laughs> yeah, and then... Uh, I guess the strategy is ultimately if everybody did that, they'd have to just get rid of the policy. Yep. Yeah. Because then that person will be like, then you got to call me King. And it'll be like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and then one up it and say, oh, okay, then I'm Lord and master. Now you got to call me Lord and master. And they're like, I was calling you King. I am not going to, you want to play the game? We'll play the game. My liege. Mm -hmm. So why, why are things so crazy? Like what? If Cultural you're, decay. That's what you think, think it is. You know, for whatever reason, over a long enough period of time, people squander what they were, what they inherited. The founding fathers had it pretty difficult. And the revolutionary period was over 20 years. It, it's, it's remarkable that people don't understand that the American war for independence was not like, we 17, declare independence and then like, and we go to yeah, war. Yeah, like 1776 but, done. No, it lasted for years. It was 20 years. Before. Yeah. 1776. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. Mean, there was the Boston Tea Party. The, the Boston that was Massacre like in, was 1770. In the, right. Yep. Yep. They had the TX. The uh, the, the Tea Party was uh, what? Uh, what, what the, the 1773 Tea Party. Tea Party. Mm -hmm. Right. It was three years after mm -hmm. the massacre. Yeah. Yep. Three years. Exactly. The The revolutionary period began uh, There's like. The Stamp it, Act, the Tea Act. They in had the all 1760s. The 1760s. That exactly. means a new. Uh, it was. There were people born in the revolutionary period while all this was going on who then fought the war for independence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These people born into a world where an oppressive force was targeting them, was stealing from them, and they lived that. And then they said, when they said we declare independence, they said, I am ready to fight for this new nation. They gifted what they had fought for to their children, who then gifted that country to their children. And then... Some of them gifted it to another generation, but around that period, you get a civil war mm -hmm. 80 years later. So this is maybe three generations on. And they had to fight to preserve. You see, they squandered to a certain degree and fought over and then had to fight again. Then you get World War I and World War II. Strassau generational theory. We are now in a period of this country where nobody's fought for anything. Yeah. Self-entitled, narcissistic, lazy. I'm not saying every millennial. I'm not saying every Gen Zer. I'm saying more and more we are seeing the emergence of narcissistic entitlement. People who demand without doing the work. And of course, if people don't do work, things don't exist. And I think a lot of them are just, they want to be a part of something big. Like our generation was 9-11. That was our something big. That was something that united us all. That was something we could all get behind, something that we all thought we were going to fight for justice. Like, like you know, it, we're, we're kind of like we're figuring it out because like we were kids at the time, like both of us were high school aged. Um, so 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 that was like our thing. But now we're 20, 25 years away from it, you know, 23 years away from it. And we have a generation of kids who don't have that. So it's like everything that happens has to be their thing. It's like, oh my God, Me Too movement. That's our thing. Black Lives Matter. That's they no our purpose. thing. They, it, no purpose. But exactly. also, they're narcissists. Yes. Not all of them. There's a lot of them. There's a, a lot of them. Yeah, there was that study about the left wing and narcissistic personality. This work is beneath me. I should be famous. Mm -hmm. the, 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 de the demand for fame is terrifying. Or they think that they, they don't see the value in work in and of itself. They think that work has to be activism. Right. You know, and, 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 and because they think that that's their purpose. That's where they're, they're going to get fulfillment. And they don't realize that that's not going to work. You know, yeah. that, that fulfillment comes from relationship well, with you, your creator. You look at some of the, the like, community. the communists. Yeah. Exactly. You look at some of the communists and they're like, you know, what's your job going to be after the revolution? I'm going to run a farm. And it's like, you sleep till noon. 
You have no idea about running a farm, you know, because they've, they've just been activists their whole lives. And they have this fantasy that they're just going to live on a farm and everything's going to be happy and they're going to paint. And that that's not I would, reality. I would, I would love to work on a farm. Mm-hmm. To wa- I, I wake up with the sun yep. every day. To wake up at the crack of dawn, to get out there and go hang out the chickens for a little bit, collect some eggs, chop some wood, tend to the animals. That day sounds amazing. Yeah. You're getting physically <laughs> active. You're, fe- you're getting sweaty. You're feeling good. You're productive. Getting sun. You're getting sun. Mm-hmm. Talk about, that's the way humans are supposed to be living. 100%. Yep. Yeah, I love good that. hard work, roll up your sleeves. Yeah. You know? Uh, so, sometimes I wonder how much of what we're seeing with all the craziness is just part of an empire that's on its way out. You know, it, it, like good. all, all imp- all empires, they're cyclical and they fall. I worry about what's going to replace our empire. I, I don't. It, I'm not worried. You not? Well, that's I'm, I'm glad it's happening. Worried? The empire is the wokeness. Oh, oh right. Oh, I'm, I was thinking of the constitutional empire. Oh, the constitution. No, no, no. The, the This country was subverted a long time ago mm-hmm. and it's institutionally captured. Mm-hmm. The same people who are woke are the ones waving Ukraine flags. The people who want international war and conflict and invasion in Syria and, and these other countries... They overlap almost one for one with woke people. Not completely, but very much so. Like when you see these, uh, uh, without naming any of them, when I see leftist high profile YouTubers with a million subs, and I mean leftist, not liberal, saying, look, we don't like Joe Biden, but we can't have Trump. I'm like, oh, please, (laughs) your overlap is apparent. I would vote for Dave Smith, but I understand voting for Trump on the foreign policy issue. What I see is empire in decline. And that is wokeness. When the empire crumbles and it looks like it is because they cannot maintain Joe Biden, come on, the international, the, the liberal world order, they called it the CFR, Council on Foreign Relations, calls it the liberal world order. And it's it's breaking apart. And when it does, yeah, we'll have problems with China, but we will be better off greatly. We will have better, stronger borders. We will start rebuilding community. Our constitution will be reinforced. Wokeness will not be able to exist because anti-meritocratic policies and ideas cannot survive without life support. Without the printing of money, the Federal Reserve and international conflict, wokeness evaporates overnight and people who want to eat have to work. And it's not going to be the hardest life in the world. It's just going to be you don't get to write BuzzFeed articles about Brad Pitt's junk and get paid $90,000 a year. That's psychotic. No, you're going to have to go and like plant a garden. And learn some basic animal care. And you're going to live pretty well. It's remarkable that the left believes that medieval peasants had more time off than they did. <laughs> yeah, it's laughable. That's that whole but I'm like, not knowing how to run a farm thing. <laughs> no one's stopping you from going and working on a farm. No one's, you can go out right now. They would love to have you. And many of these farms pay like 14 bucks an hour for a labor. They're like, you know, the medieval peasants got 100 days off and they got sun. And it's like dude if you want to go pick berries Mm -hmm. i know people who've done it i knew somebody who was worked at starbucks and then said this is boring and then looked online and found farms and they said we pay 14 bucks an hour for daily crop harvesting and stuff like that and they went and started picking fruit and they're like it is so cool to go out with a little cart fill it full of apples and stuff bring it back in and then watch them do the sorting i make 14 bucks an hour i'm like i'm out in the sun all day i get sweaty i get exercise it's so much fun and I was, they were like, I just needed a side job and I wanted to get out into nature. And I'm like, see that right there? See, I believe you. These people who are in cities and like, I should be a medieval peasant. <laughs> like, okay, go work on a farm. Yeah. They don't totally. want to do it. They want to do nothing. <laughs> or they, they want to be famous for something. I love, you know what I love? I love when these people quote themselves on the internet. They'll write something and then put it in quotes and put their name under it. And I'm like, <laughs> you just quote yourself. Yep. And, and it's like, there is a general understanding in just because somebody of repute said it doesn't mean that it's better said than what you said but there's a reason why we quote people and it's not because one day they said something we decided we're going to attach ourselves to it it's because there's someone who has contributed greatly and then presented us with an idea and and, resonated right but i just think this generation millennials uh and a lot of gen z I do think Gen Z has a lot of really, really great components to it. I think Gen Zers are seeing the ills of millennials, and I believe millennials are the worst. I think that if you were to look at like, if we're going to do, uh, this is fascinating, if we're going to do like a flat line, it's like the older generation to the younger generation, and then a deviation scale, it's like the boomers have a little bit, Gen Xers have a little bit more, millennials spike really high, and then Gen Z is a little bit higher than Gen X, but way lower than millennials. 
in that whatever happened to millennials, man, broke the brains of a generation <laughs> I, that I, not even Gen Z experiences. I think it's because, um, I mean, millennials, I'm, I'm, I'm in the zennial category. It's the micro generation. In this generation, you're probably in it too. It had to go through. Zennial? No, I'm a millennial. Zen. Okay, you're a millennial. So, yeah. so it, the, the, I think it's 78 to 85. So I put yeah. it right at the end. Yeah, so, yeah, so you're just, just out of it. But we had to go through at a very impressionable age. We had to learn, um, we had to go from analog to digital. So, and we had to learn this at like middle school, at like right through middle school and high school. And we had to switch how we did life and it yeah. didn't make sense. And then we were the first ones on the internet, you know, so we had the ALL and so we had to kind of like, we had connections. We were the last group of people to play outside and yeah. bike to our friend's house and knock on the door. That doesn't happen anymore. Yep. We we're the last generation to or do that. Or not knowing where your friends were. Yeah, not knowing. I'm, like I'm 10. Yeah, I go to, to find my their friend's bikes. house, knock on the door. Mm -hmm. You know, is Jason home? Nope. Do you know where he is? I don't know. He went riding his bike. I'm like, I guess I'm not hanging out with him today. Yeah, that was we're the last generation to have that, you know, so we had to like relearn how to exist. And um, it, it tapped into a lot of narcissism. I mean, it tapped into it, it tapped into it. It uh, coaxed know, out I mean, a lot of mental illness and I, stuff, too. I think that's a component. Maybe it's the trophy participation trophy. Yes. In, uh, awards. And then I think once you get once you start introducing participation trophies, Millennials start developing this narcissism, narcissism and entitlement. Yes. Then with Gen Z, with everyone already getting it, they're meaningless. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why they want to be famous. So for the, so I look at this way, the millennials are raised in a culture where it's like, get a trophy and you're good. And they go, oh, I want to win a trophy. Then they say, we're going to give you a trophy no matter what you do. And they're like, oh, I get a trophy. Mm -hmm. I should get a trophy. Trophies are good things. Yes. Then Gen Z is raised where everyone has trophies and they're like, who cares? Everyone has one. It's meaningless to me. So that kind of reduces the deviation towards narcissism. It's like a, a certain degree. demoralization too. To it like, is. Yeah, there's there's nothing to work for. The problem is Gen Z, I think more than any ge generation lacks uh, skills. Yes. And that is not an insult of Gen Z. It's an insult to Gen X mm -hmm. and, uh, and to a certain degree boomers. You know, I love boomers because they've made so much awesome stuff, but man, they did not raise millennials well. No, they didn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's sad because... There were a, a ton of opportunities for it. Star Trek, the next generation, should have been mandatory watching in schools. The problem with schools is that they have detached themselves from the world and it, and it make no sense. Our culture does things. Finance, pop culture, physical activity, mental activity. What do schools do? An interrogative sentence ends in a, in a question mark. <laughs> An imperative sentence ends in a period. Yeah. How important was that ever to my life? I guess I can tell someone those things. History is very important. But I think you get a show like Star Trek The Next Generation. It was the biggest show on television at the time. It was syndicated on multiple networks. And I'm not literally saying every day play an episode, but playing an episode at least once in a school year to say, this is what your parents are watching. This is why they're watching it. Take a look at this show so you can see, and, I can ex and you can ask me questions about what the show is, how does it work? And then you get a kid saying, why is this show so popular? And the teacher can say, you know, honestly, I, I don't know. I have an opinion on it. It's dramatic. There's action. There's, there's philosophy. Uh, it's so popular and it's on three networks. Do you know what a network is? Right. You've seen it. You've watched ABC, right? Well, this airs on these channels, CBS and, and you know, UPN. It's syndicated, meaning it's explaining common worldly things to kids so they can understand it is, is, what, is what I think we need to introduce. Yeah, the boomers seem like they were a very self-focused generation and just sort of, you know, did did passive parenting to a, yep. to a T and, and weren't. I don't want to be like my parents. My parents were strict. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it made you a good person. Yeah. You, yeah. you the, the Star Trek The Next Generation is, is, in my opinion, will always be looked at as one of the greatest philosophical and artistic feats that humanity has created. Just, just anybody who's not watched the show. They're like, that's nerd stuff. Now you're wrong. When, when Picard talks about, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, there is a, there is a character named Data. For those that don't, for those that know Star Trek, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those that don't, Data's an android. He's the only of his kind, for the most part. He ends up having a brother and another brother. Like, they're, they're androids that were created by a, a scientist. They are sentient life. There's an episode where a tribunal occurs where they try to determine whether or not he is entitled to civil rights or not as a, as a creature or a machine amazing philosophical arguments about the inherent rights of life. Wow. But the best, that, well, there's, there's just so much good stuff. One of the best is when Data the Android creates a progeny. 
And he says, it is the, it is the function of all life to re- reproduce. And I thought it imperative that I do the same. And so he creates a lo- uh, lol, a daughter. And then Starfleet officers outranking Captain Picard say, you will order Data to hand his child over to the state. They don't say it like that. They say, you need to understand that Data being the only of his kind, we need to be able to preserve and replicate this information and knowledge so that Data and what he is can persist. And so they go and they say, you are property. Actually, I think this is, this, this might be the same episode the, the, where they determine whether or not he's, no, 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 they're different, they're different. One episode, they want him Data to turn himself over so they can research him and study him. And the other, they want to take his daughter from him. And Captain Picard says, I, I will defy those orders. He, he, he says, you know, Data, you are here by order to turn over your, your daughter. And Data says, okay. And Picard says, belay that order. And they go, excuse me. And then the, the admiral says, you are risking your career, Picard. And he goes like, so what? I will not allow the state to take this man's child. And I'm just like, that's the kind of moral framework that influences a lot of what I believe, a lot of what people in this country believe. And then the, the best, the best, there are four lights. It's a meme. Most people have heard it. Maybe they don't know where it comes from. Captain Picard is being tortured by an adversarial alien race. And uh, the goal is his rank. Brings him in and says, Picard, we're both, you know, ranking men. We are both men of, of repute, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I can give you a good life. He lies to him and says, Starfleet's being destroyed. Our, our, our armada is wiping them out. You've lost the war. Why don't you live comfortably on Cardassia? That's their planet. And he's like, why don't you live comfortably? And he says, all you have to do is tell me, how many lights do you see? And Picard, who's been stripped of his clothes and is wearing a torture device, says, there are four lights. Shock. Tortured. And he falls on the ground, writhing in agony. You're mistaken. There are five lights. Now tell me, how many lights do you see? And Picard says, four. And he shocks him again. Hmm. And it created this cultural meme, there are four lights. The refusal to deny reality. Today, what do we have? What is two plus two equal? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Four or five. How remarkable that hmm. replicated in the real world, they would demand of you, you say two plus two is five. No, it's four. And they ask you again. You're mistaken. You don't want to lose your job, do you? You don't want your children taken from you, do you? So, for me to uh, sit here and proudly talk about Star Trek The Next Generation, <laughs> but this is why. Because these questions of morality were, were given through a pop culture TV show that inspired so many people that people who were inspired conveyed in these ideas. And if you're not a big fan of like the, the sci-fi elements, what you really have in this show is naval tradition, the, the, the military ranks, naval exploration. You could do the whole show as uh, uh, on Earth with a seafaring vessel during World War, you know, during World War II, replace the alien race with a foreign na- uh, nationality torturing someone, doing the exact same things. The ideas are brilliant. Hmm. And conveying that morality is so important, in my opinion. So when I look at something like that, I grew up on that. I was inspired by that. I believe in that. I also recognize children today who are growing up on neo Marxist garbage, when they're my age, they're going to say, I remember the Transformers episode when Starscream said he was non-binary and I felt so much <laughs> yeah. in my heart. Yeah, They're going to say that. We need them to be exposed to the ideas of classical liberalism. And I don't mean American style colloquial liberalism. I mean the founding fathers views of what it means to be a good citizen, to be responsible, but to have your rights protected. Yeah. So this sort of comes back to Brave Books a little bit. Our vision for Brave Books is when kids hit three years old, their parents or grandparents subscribe them to our little Freedom Island Book Club, and they get a new book every single month, a picture book for about four or five years, and it switches over to two chapter books. And basically, the topics that we hit, um, the stories, they they grow with the kids, but they grow up in our world. And, right. and that world, like our whole brand, our whole business is built on trust with our with our customers that that we're not going to go woke. And, and they're going to grow up in a sa- safe place for their imaginations to run wild because they need that. It's so helpful. You know, it obviously made an impact on you. And right now they don't have that. All, all the all the brands are corrupted and they need those heroes, those worlds of stories that resonate with them that that, you know, because it's like you talk you want to talk to your kid about 
whatever it is, gender identity, all that, you we're used to talking to adults and we talk to adults through, you know, conceptual type language. Memes. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the way to reach a kid is to tell a story. And then mm. that gives you the framework to then have a conversation. And so, so like with our books, we we design them to where we have a story is like two thirds of it. And then the back, we have these games and discussion questions so that the story serves as the framework to then have a conversation between you and your kids. And our, our hope is that, you know, it, they'll bring families together, start conversations so that the parent becomes the primary resource that kids look to when they're confronted with whatever. You know, you know what's really great about the style of how you do this? You said you, you, they get a book once a month? Yeah. Do you remember being a kid and how exciting it was to get mail? Oh, they freak out. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. The, remember remember yeah. the, I don't know if you guys did this, you get the scholastic yes. order form and we'd look through it and then you, Pick your books. you get a, you, you, you write down how many books you want on that little strip yeah. in the back yeah. and then rip it out and give it to teacher. Oh, Mom yeah. will give you 10 bucks and the book comes yeah. and you're uh, like, yeah. it's book day. I so did. I had a, it was a babysitter, I was a babysitter's club and it, and I got a, a new book, like a package every mm -hmm. single month and I looked forward to it and, and that got me really invested. I was so excited to read the next book and so this is, that model is brilliant to, to bring, to get kids excited about that in that form. And I was going to say about what you said about Star Trek, the, the writers studied authoritarian regimes. Yeah. Absolutely. And they, they wrote about them in a way that was um, entertaining. Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. This era of Star Trek, no joke. There's an episode of Deep Space Nine called In the Pale Moonlight. At this point, uh, Next Generation was 89 until I think 97 or something like that. Maybe, maybe I'm getting the years wrong. Maybe it was 87 or something. I don't know. Um, they had Voyager. They had Deep Space Nine. In this era of Star Trek, you had this continuous story that was masterfully done. Deep Space Nine is about a space station. A wormhole opens that connects two quadrants of the galaxy, which introduces new alien races of massive power. A war breaks out called the Dominion War, where... They're called changelings. They're creatures that have moderate shape-shifting abilities, begin infiltrating. And then when the war breaks out, the Federation is losing. In the Star Trek universe, uh, the next generation you have... Let's, let's go back in time. Uh, in the original series, Klingons are the bad guys. When they create the next generation, they say, let's show that there's been development. And they, they now show that a Klingon actually works on a Federation ship as an officer. Uh, and this was to show the pro that progress had occurred. They wrote an amazing backstory as to how this happened. It's called the Kittimer Accords. What happened was Romulans, another bad guy from the original series, began attacking a colony outpost of Klingons, women and children, because they're merciless. And the Enterprise got uh, the, the distress signal and charged full speed to the attack, sacrificing itself to save the women and children uh, of the Klingons. The Klingons being an honor-based society said we were we, we did not realize how honorable you know the federation was and this created an alliance yeah then in deep space nine i'm giving you all this backstory but trust me i just this stuff is so profound and and, and good morals and uh, in the dominion war the romulans absolutely will not join the federation and the klingons as they're being crushed by the dominion so the uh commander of the space station organizes a false flag attack, executing, assassinating a Romulan senator to frame the Dominion to force them to enter the war on the side of the Federation. You could replace all of this stuff with American tropes throughout American history and the message is there. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's some people might be like, ah, oh, that's sci-fi stuff, I'm not into that. Like, make it about World War II, whatever. The point is the moral message behind it. And then you have this uh, monologue from Cisco, the commander, explaining the, the deep moral questions of killing a senator to trick an enemy nation into joining your side in a war, and it worked. <laughs> and then they begin winning. Crazy, awesome storytelling. Yeah. We don't have that anymore, you know? But we are, we are running late, so I guess my, yeah. my last question for you, otherwise I'll just ramble about Star Trek and how much I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't mind the newer stuff that's coming out. I think it's okay, but you mentioned as kids get older, they get two chapter books. Yeah. I'm wondering what about young adult? What about, you know, kids who are now looking for those bigger stories that might contain the moral lessons that I've been talking about. Yeah, it's it's coming. So, so yeah, the vision is, uh, chapter books will probably start 
coming out in the next 12 to 18 months. Cool. Um, but, but yeah, that's the vision. So when, when they're in that three to seven, eight year old range, they're getting picture books, then chapter books, and then young adult novels, all that stuff. All the while we're, we're giving, um, animated television shows, live action television shows. Cool. And, and they just grow up with this world. And so w when you're going off on your Star Trek rant, I was sort of, I was listening to you, but I was sort of envisioning a kid 20 years from now, giving that same rant, but talking about freedom. Island. Yes. So I'm, what I want JK Rowling to do, especially now that she's experiencing it. What did she do? Harry Potter. What's it about? It's about Hitler. Like anybody who's read Harry Potter knows that he's talking about Hitler. He's a magic supremacist with large followers. They take over the government, blah, blah, blah. And uh, what did she write for the prequels? Magic Hitler. Seriously, Grindelwald is once again a magic supremacist who's doing the exact same things. She needs to write a story in the Harry Potter universe about wizards and witches who think it is wrong to have magic because it creates class oppression between those with magic and muggles, <laughs> those with magic and those without, and then you end up with a Stalinist. Mm -hmm. So she can tell the moral lesson of why it's wrong to strip people of their of their rights and privileges and things like that. Have you ever seen the crossover of Harry Potter and Star Wars? How the parallels in <laughs> no. that? No. Well, it's it's uh you know the the guy who's got a crush on the girl. And he's his scruffy friend ends up, she ends up with a scruffy friend and they oh, yeah. don't have lightsabers. They have wands and there's just all these, you know, then there's Vader as opposed to Voldemort. Uh, Voldemort. So yeah, there's just all these parallels. Too. Oh yeah. Well, anyway, we, we went a little bit over, I think, oh, but uh, thanks for hanging out, man. This has been a blast. Mm -hmm. So fun. Do you want to yeah. shout out your yeah. links and stuff? Uh, Bravebooks.com. Go Bravebooks.com. Subscribe. Kids, nieces, nephews, grandkids. Um, yeah. You'll, you'll get some great books and it'll help. Bring the family together, get off screens, read a story, have some conversations that are meaningful. It'll be a blessing. Right on. Great. Um, and you can find me at uh, Twitter, TRHL Official. And yeah, just go ahead, follow me there. Become a member at TimCast.com to support our work directly. This show is brought to you by CastBrewCoffee.com. Go there, buy our coffee. We sponsor ourselves. We're going to be launching our own companies so that we never have to worry about anybody pulling sponsorship or getting pressure from anybody else. But uh, be becoming a member at TimCast.com just directly funds everything. And we've got uh, more shows coming. We've got some debates planned, and we're going to be increasingly shifting into a conversational slash debate format for this show, too. So I'm really excited. Thanks for hanging out, everybody, and we'll see you all next time.